All right. Um, hello, people. Um, so this will be, this is like kind of going to be like a little bit of a small group. I'm kind of anticipating people are going to like drop in and out for you know whatever it is they want to see. Um, and uh, today we're going to basically be doing the uh, third of five um, in a series about doing Julia for economics. And today I'm basically going to be talking about automatic differentiation, which is how you get derivatives very easily, and how you do um, optimization with like any particular um, you know nonlinear objective functions, and um, you know integer programming and some other stuff like that. So this should this should be useful for basically everyone who does any kind of optimization or automatic differentiation or whatever. Um, and uh, to the people who are here, you can just kind of drop in and out as you need. I'm not going to be bent out of shape about it. Okay. All right. Um, so just kind of a refresher on who I am, in case you are unaware. Uh, I'm Cameron Pfeiffer, and I'm a PhD student at, in finance at the University of Oregon. Um, but I'm visiting here at the Stanford GSB. Um, and uh, I typically work on kind of like Bayesian econometric stuff, asset pricing, industrial organization. I'm really bad at industrial organization because it's weird, hard. Um, and I basically do kind of like general computer go fast stuff. So like. This is kind of like my beat. That's why I enjoy it a lot. So I'm great, like very happy that I can share it with people. Okay, so um, howdy, hello, greeting. Um, so today we're basically going to be talking first about automatic differentiation, which is how you get exact derivatives for arbitrary code. Um, and this is like a really, really nice feature of Julia that it happens to do fairly well. Like automatic differentiation is a generally a very difficult problem, um, but Julia, you can kind of get a lot, get a lot of things for free in Julia, which is really nice, you know. Um, and then we're going to talk about just general optimization. So the two packages I'm going to talk about are optim.jo, which does um, nonlinear optimization with, you know, simplex methods, grading methods. If you have Hessians, you can use those as well. Um, and then I'm going to be talking about jump, which is Julia for mathematical programming, which is a very specific, specific uh, domain specific language for doing describing optimization problems. Um, and jump happens to be kind of a monolith in the, in the Julia ecosystem. So it'll be nice to share that with people. Um, so there'll be intermittent periods um, where I'm just to put up a concept check. And so we'll basically just work through some examples together. Um, and uh, you're free to, to, to do those or not do those, it's up to you. Um, but I'll walk through the examples uh, myself to show you the answer and kind of how I think about doing it, okay? Um, and we're going to go from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. And we'll do uh, 10 minute breaks at the top of the hour. And then about halfway through at 11, we'll do a 15 minute break. Um, and ask questions as needed. Just kind of jump in. Feel free to interrupt me. I don't mind being interrupted. I kind of prefer it. Um, and uh, yeah, if you need like a refresher about any of the like Julia basics, you don't remember what that is, just kind of jump in. Um, I'm like happy to, to, to refresh people, especially since I tend to like roll over like really basic stuff. It's a really bad habit of mine. Okay, so all the resources for everything that we're doing here and all the past uh, lectures are in this GitHub repo. Um, and um, I'll put up all the recording links and everything up there. So if you can, you want to go through and read them later, that's, that's perfectly fine. Okay. All right. So I'm going to kind of leap in here a little bit. Um, so automatic differentiation is a tool for taking computational gradients of, or derivatives or Hessians or whatever of various functions. And so this is really useful for a lot of reasons, right? The, the first one that's very, that's, that's super obvious for our purposes today is optimization, right? We know that if you, you know, like the classic way that you optimize kind of a smooth function is you take the derivative and you check all the places where it's zero, right? And so Computationally, it's really handy to have make, make it so that your computer can calculate those for you so you don't have to do stupid math. Um, and you can also you know, calculate derivatives of weird functions that you might have. And those derivatives might have an economic intuition, right? So I'm coming at this from kind of an economics perspective. Um, but you, know, you might be very interested as, as a quantity of interest in derivatives of some, some particular function that you're studying. Okay? So it's, it's useful to have your computer be able to do this for you. Okay, so you know this this is the common way that people are used to taking derivatives of things. Um, this is what you learned in calculus class, the one that maybe gave you a lot of headaches and kind of sucked for a while. Um, uh, but basically, 
what you do is you have some function here, which is f of x, and this is just maps to sine squared. And you can calculate this with the chain rule, right? So you take the derivative of the outer, um, which gives us cosine x squared, and then you take the derivative of the inner, which is x squared. So you get 2x cosine x squared, right? So that's, that's, how, that's how you do this when you do like very basic math, okay? That's super simple. This is an analy analytic derivative. Um, if you're doing this computationally, if you're using like Mathematica or something, this is what you would refer to as a, um, as a symbolic derivative as well. Okay. okay, so if you write this in Julia, it's super easy. It's just f of x is equal to sine of x squared. And the derivative is 2x times cosine x squared, right? So I've just written up these, you know, the function is derivative is two separate functions. Both of them are functions of x, okay? And um, so I can kind of plot these here. If you want to see what they look like, this is pretty simple, right? It's, you know, basically this XS line here is I'm making, you know, a window of X values from zero to three with 100, 100 values. And I'm just going to plot the function as derivative. Okay, nice and easy, nothing too complicated. Um, oh, let me make sure that I pull up the chat as well. Okay. Okay. All right. So sometimes it's a huge pain to calculate analytic derivatives, right? So sometimes you have a lot of parameters to keep track of. Sometimes you just like, it's just like kind of, maybe it's a little too much math. Maybe you get bored like I do. Like I get really bored calculating derivatives. So I don't like, I don't really, I get tired and I just want my computer to do it for me. Okay. So um, if you have a weird function that you either can't calculate the derivative analytically for, or you don't want to, you can use automatic differentiation. This is how we get this df of x function, which is this 2x cosine of x squared function in the example. Um, and we can get our computer to spit this out very quickly and easily. Okay. All right. So when anytime you enter into the automatic differentiation world, they start talking about two things that are really, really boring, which is forward mode and reverse mode. I think they're boring. A lot of people don't seem to think that they're boring. Um, but basically, there's two ways that you can computationally compute an automatic, uh, an automatic derivative. And so the really basic way is what you and I do when we do math, which is called forward mode. In forward mode, you basically work your way out from the outside of the function to the inside of the function. And you accumulate the derivatives as you go along and just multiply them by each other. Right? That's the chain rule. Then you can do this reverse mode thing, which is kind of an alg algorithmic trick. Um, where you start from the outside in. You basically jiggle the output and you look at what the equivalent uh, jiggle is of an input. Okay? I'm not going to go much more into forward and reverse mode uh, exactly what they are, but I will show you uh, when and why they are better. Okay? So forward mode is really good for short numbers, small numbers of parameters. Reverse mode is great for um, large numbers of parameters, and particularly if you have a scalar function. So lots of parameters, scalar output. Okay, that's the one thing you want to remember. Okay. So I just want you guys to like limp along for now. Like I'm not going to like dig into reverse diff just because it's oh god, it's kind of a pain. Um, so I'm just going to kind of show you how to do this and kind of show you what it looks like when you stretch them out. Okay. Um, and if you're very interested in in how automatic differentiation works at a core level, which you will need at some point if you start writing your own automatic differentiation rules. Um, I recommend going to the chain rules documentation, which basically walks through all of the math here. Um, and so basically the way this works is you end up writing a little rule that describes the, the, the adjoint of, the, of, your, of your problem. And chain rules makes it really nice and they have very good documentation. But and then are you going to talk about when one is better than the other? Like, or why people yes. have preferences? Yeah, so basically, yeah. I'll, I have like a little numerical example that will make this look really nice. Okay. Um, so uh, we're going to tinker around with the two big packages for automatic differentiation. So this is reverse diff and forward diff. Um, and so you can add these to your, um, to your uh, Julia, Julia environment with the first one here, if you're typing in the REPL, or if you just have source code there, you can do this import package, package.add thing. Both of these are satisfactory. Um, and it may take a second for it to warm up. Um, so I'll let people kind of like uh, run through this as needed. All right, your thumbs up, good, thumbs up. All right, cool, I'm getting thumbs up around the room. Okay, so let's think around how they work. Um, I'm going to use import rather than using 
when I bring them in just because they have very similar function names and I don't want them stepping on each other. Um, and I want it to be really clear when I'm using reverse diff and when I'm using forward diff. Okay. So um, for forward diff, we're going to use this forward diff dot derivative, and then we're going to give it a function, which is f here, and then we're going to give it a point to evaluate that derivative at, which is x. Right? And that could be an array, or that could be uh, this is scalar, sorry. So that's that's univariate. Um, and reverse diff really only works with array inputs, right? So it's designed for array functions. So we're going to use the dot gradient function for our scalar function that I wrote here, um, but it's just going to be an array of one unit. Okay. So when you see derivative and gradient, they're 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 the, the same. And I'll talk about forward diff dot gradient in a second, but I want to you know that to be available to you. Okay. All right. Good question. Yes. Uh, does is it possible? I imagine that computing derivatives is expensive computationally relative to evaluating them. So, is there a way you can like cache, right? Like you could like cache the the whatever happens under the hood to figure out to, to do the simulation yeah. of the derivative. Yeah. So you can then just plug in values later, or yes. you have to do this kind of call up. Um. So actually, these are not amazingly expensive, okay. like what you would think. Like you know, you when you calculate uh, the when you calculate the value of a function, you just can basically also just like go along and accumulate the derivative yep. as you roll along, and that ends up being like fairly quick. Um, as for caching, basically what happens underneath the hood, Reverse Diff has a tool for this where you can basically compile the tape. Yep. And um, I have an example of how to do that, and that definitely speeds things up. Like it's like it's like a five to ten x yeah, for like compiling the gradient tape. I do whenever I've done reflection or anything where you're mm -hmm. like looking at source code to figure out how to like yes. do something based on code of a function. Mm -hmm. Like it's always really slow. So I yeah, sure. yeah. For forward diff, I don't know. I you know forward diff would just kind of um, you can you can pass in a buffer as well, which I'll show you how to okay. do that as well, and that helps a little bit, but not like a ridiculous amount. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so basically, what I'm doing here is I've constructed four gradient, four gradient slash derivative functions. Um, so our function there is at the top, which is our third line. The second line, I guess, is, you know, ignore white space. This one right here. This is just our original function. And then I have the exact derivative. This is the one I calculated using boring old math. This is how we used to do math. Um, and then to calculate the forward uh, derivative using forward diff. I'm basically just going to call forward diff dot derivative with f, right? Notice that this is actually this is what's technically called a closure, right? Where I'm taking I'm taking this f function and I'm putting wrapping it inside of exact df, and exact df or forward df only takes one input, which is the point to evaluate it at. Um, and then this one here is doing forward diff but calling the gradient version of it. Um, and I'm basically just, um, all I'm doing is creating a new function, z maps to f of z1, blah, 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 basically. So this is just wrapping um, x, our input, in an array, and then unwrapping it on the other side and then calling the function. And then right here, I'm calling the first value of the gradient, just because it's, there's only one input. This is just a, a, a one element array. And then for reverse diff, it's exactly the same call as for forward diff. But I just put reverse diff in front of it, okay. and then I'm, I'm printing out all of the uh, all the values here, and you can see they're all the same, right? So not only is our, our our exact analytic derivative that I calculated by hand, um, it is exactly equal to forward diff and reverse diff, right? So automatic differentiation is like an exact method. It it basically accumulates your derivatives from primitives. Right, so it's actually very nice. The numerical error is like extremely low relative to the hand coded derivative for most functions. Okay. All right. So here I'm actually plotting them. I'm plotting all three of them. And there's only, you know, there's one purple line, which is because all of the derivatives are exactly identical for all the way across this, across this uh, this domain. Okay. So this is this is a just to showcase basically that they're exact and they're right. And that's really nice. Okay. And pro tip, um, Julia Floss, if you give them a function um, in the Y part 
of the plot, they'll just plot the function for you with the x's. So that's that's just kind of a nice little feature of plot.jl that I love. Okay. So we're gonna do this, uh, we're gonna do this like first little little example here, and I'll give you guys a minute or two. Um, let me paste this code into the chat. Um, but basically what I want us to do is I want to take this kind of um, like this loss function for OLS, right? So this is like a very, very simple, uh, simple function to use. And um, so what you're going to do is define this function f of beta x and y, x and y here are data, and beta is the parameter estimate. And you're basically just going to calculate the sum of squared errors for those two. Okay. And so I want you to use reverse diff and or forward diff. That's up to you how, how, how far into it you want to go. Um, and um, I want you to evaluate it at beta hat, which is x prime x inverse x prime y, right? So that's like the that's like the classic result you get from the normal equation. And I want you to plug it in and confirm that you get a gradient where basically all the values are zero, right? That's like that's exactly what you would expect from completing this minimization problem. Um, and if you're like really quick, I want you to see if you can back out beta hat by grid search. So just build a grid of betas, plug them into the gradients, to the gradient function, and find the one that has the gradient closest to zero. You should see that being very close to beta hat. Okay, does this problem make sense? Okay. Okay, so I'll give you like uh, two or three minutes for that and ask questions if needed. Cameron? Yes. Why did you use import instead of using? Um, because forward diff and reverse diff both export like a dot gradient function. And so they collide with each other. So if you're going to use both and you use using, then you'll have to qualify them anyway by putting reverse diff dot gradient or forward diff dot gradient just because they step on each other. I see. Um, but if the, sorry, so what does import do instead? So import just says, um, so if I do, um, here, I'll go around here real quick. So if I do import reverse diff and I call gradient, um, f of x, it doesn't know what that means because import doesn't actually pull in the gradient function. It requires you to qualify this, um, with, oh, I see. with and the otherwise function. it'll, it'll try to guess and it might get flipped and you might not remember which one it is. Yeah. So if I call re reverse diff, then I can do gradient f of x. Because it, it goes and looks to see what's exported and it'll pull in gradient. The problem comes in when I use using forward diff as well, because now when it sees this, it says, oh, okay, I actually have two versions of gradient. One comes from reverse diff, one comes from forward diff. So import is just a way to like get around this and make it more obvious that um, you know nothing we're, we have to use. We have to specify which one we want to use. Okay, I assume people kind of have a sense of the problem now. So I'll, I'm going to start like kind of just like dropping little hints in case people are. Uh... I don't, I don't, I don't remember the normal equation. 
me I lose my economist card. Okay. So here I'm just defining my objective function. F of beta. So that'll be really nice. And I'm, I'm, you know, when you're doing kind of like optimization stuff, it's really nice to have a function that is only a function of the thing that you want to optimize, right? And so uh, y and x are available in global scope up here, and then this function just kind of closes around them. So I'm just going to vary beta, and that's the only thing I'm going to do. Okay. All right. And then I'll pause here and see if everyone's like ready for me to do the do the kind of final step here. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. So let's see if I want to get the get the gradient here. I'm just going to call this Brad. And uh, I'll start with forward diff here. I'm just going to call it dot gradient. And the function I have is f. And I'm going to evaluate it at theta hat. Okay. All right. All right. Oops. Nope. Actually, I'm going to use this. Sorry, I should have prepped this for just, uh, just a second ago. Okay, I was going to pre-compile stuff. All I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the gradient for, for this one here. I'll do this Brad, Brad forward, and I'll do Brad, Brad reverse. And all I'm doing here is changing the thing that's in the front from, reverse, from forward diff to reverse diff. Okay. And uh, while I'm waiting for uh, everything to kind of pre-compile, this laptop is much slower than my other desktop. Um, I'm also going to kind of like go through this grid search uh, uh, situation, right? So um, let's see here. So I have um, n dims, n dims, sorry, is equal to two, right? So this is my this is how big my parameter space is, and then I'm going to specify a grid here, which I'm going to do um, x y for x in. And I'll specify like a, you know, some kind of window here. And I'll do this from, I don't know, let's say I just want to go from negative five to five, and then I'll do length is equal to a hundred. It's really big, not not fine enough, but let's say let's say that was a good 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 example. Okay. Let's correct that typo there. Okay, objects of adjoint are not callable. There we go. All right, I'm making all kinds of fun errors today. Loving it. Okay, so this thing that's that's uh, that just spat out on the screen here. This is going to be my grid, my parameter grid. And uh, if I wanted to calculate my gradients, I'm just going to to map. Um, uh, I'll call this um, beta guess into forward diff that gradient f at beta guess. And then I'm just going to feed it to my grid. Okay. okay, so now this thing that's fitting out to the screen, this is all of my gradients. Okay. And let's say I wanted to calculate the norm from that. So I just wanted the ones with the smallest norm. Okay, so I'm just going to call map and then I'm going to define yet another function. And so I'm going to accept, accept some gradient here. And then I'm just going to calculate uh, sum of g, I don't know, squared. Okay, and then I'm just going to give it my gradients. All right, so now I have all the norms for those gradients. And then I can basically just do find min. Um, I actually call it norms. Cool. 
So at 61.72 is where the min is. Min is. Do, do, do. And we'll call this uh, radius. Okay. Oh, did I? Ah, damn it. That was, that's all me. Okay. All right, cool. Awesome. I did it. All right. So this is a, this is actually a result of like not having a fine enough grid here. Let me like actually make that much, much, much thinner. Okay. Oh, now I made it. Oh God, I made this. This yeah. is a two, two, two square in array. I'll just, I'll just put it in, put it, put it, put it close to my actual parameter estimates. Okay, so let's go from zero to three. All right. So I'll let that kind of, kind of roll along. Okay. Okay. And so this line right here just tells me what the, the optimal optimal is based on our, our grid search using the gradients. Okay. So this is a really, really dumb way to do kind of optimization. You're using like fancy space age automatic differentiation, but you're still doing grid search. We'll do a, like a way better example later on of how to how to um, how to get this. Okay. Um, any questions about any of this? Or like my weird implementation of it? Okay. All right, cool. Awesome. All right. So automatic differentiation usually works on any function. So you can kind of define very weird, weird functions and chances are very good, uh, depending on what you're doing, that you actually run into functions that somebody's already predefined all of the gradient rules for, which means that um, automatic differentiation just kind of goes through. Like, so for, for example here, I have like kind of a gnarly, not gnarly, it's just a weird, right? So all it does is it basically accepts an X, a mu, and a sigma. So this is three inputs. And it changes the function type based on X, right? So this is like a very non-smooth function. Um, so it's smooth in different, different intervals, basically. Um, and like the last one here is just like uh, a beta uh, log PDF times a sine Hello? times a cosine function, right? Can so these are just me? super weird. And so I can just run, like, calculate the derivatives of this function really easily. And it just kind of goes through. Um, you'll note one thing, which is that sometimes your gradients end up being undefined, right? So, so in this case, if I comment out these, this, the sine and sigma part here, this else block is not a function of mu or sigma when x is between negative one and one. Okay. And so in this case, um, uh oh, that is not what I expected. That is not what I expected at all. Also, I don't think the derivative at one would be well defined. Yes. Yeah, I'm so not sure what that would be. It's giving you numbers, even though. Oh, if I yeah, if, okay. So if I cut this out. No, so it's not even. Oh, that's. That. The, ooh, ooh. It's, really, it's it's because you're you're there's a kink in the PDF, mm. and yeah. so you shouldn't have a. Shouldn't be able to give you anything. Yeah, this should be this should be NAN. Okay, Benjamin's giving us a uh, has some comments here, which is that uh, um, earlier you said reverse diff is better for computing gradients. So for the OLF example, would it be better to use reverse diff since beta is a vector? Okay, that is a good question. The answer is forward diff is not not better at computing gradients in general. It's better at computing gradients for very large inputs. So if I have a if we had if beta was, if we had a thousand betas, like there, that was a thousand element array, then yeah, we should use reverse diff. But if it's five, forward diff is generally going to be significantly faster. Um, okay, sorry, why is there any instructions for why? Um, basically, it's less record keeping. So with forward diff, you basically have to uh, track all the inputs, how the inputs affect other inputs. Whereas if you have, or, you know, subsequent calculations, whereas reverse diff, you only have to keep track of how any particular thing affects the output. So you, you basically map directly into the output and it ends up being a lot, record, a lot of less record keeping. So it just ends up being like 
a little bit easier for kind of like big dimensional vectors. Okay. So in general, the point of this slide is to, to kind of like convince you that you should just like try automatic differentiation and hope that it works. And sometimes it does, which is really nice. Okay. The times when it stops working are um, one of the things you need to be very, very, I want to be very clear on here is that the way that AD works in Julia is that when you call dot gradient or dot Jacobian or whatever, it actually changes the type of the input. So if you were, if your function normally accepts a float 64, <laughs> there's a very consternated sign there. Um, if you have, if your function accepts like a vector of floats, usually, what uh, forward diff inverse diff do is they basically wrap that input of floats in something that accumulates, um, in basically a dual that ends up accumulating your gradients, right? So it has a, it wraps it in a special struct. And so um, the people who are groaning in the room have already run into this problem, um, but many times um, but basically the the solution here is do not over constrict your types so this this happens because people clench too hard on what they think their input should be and it's not always your problem sometimes it's somebody else's problem somebody in a package somewhere has been like no i only accept vector of float 64 which is stupid you don't want to do that sometimes you do but very rarely so i have a question about that so i when at some point when i had struggled with this the what happened was I was defining, I was passing in stuff from a diff, mm -hmm. from a, a, a struct, sorry. And in the struct, I wanted to give, I, I, I needed to declare some sort of type casting. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was breaking the auto diff. And yeah. the advice I got from uh, Chris's protege was to give an abstract type. Yes. Which then broke other things, but it works at the moment, in the moment. <laughs> yes. So here, I'll, so um, I think you're, 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 you have like a struct definition, is that yeah, right? Yeah, I have a struct definition, which. So if you're trying to like calculate, so if you have like something like a float 64. Right. And you try to take the derivative of this, like, and, uh, and you try to, and you have a function that constructs a something uh -huh. and tries to put something in A, it'll freak out because the second I try to create a something with like 1.0, Right. This is easy when I call this, but if I call the gradient of something, some function of something, where I realize this is a terrible name for this, this is a pedagogical example. Um, like the good, the better example for this, the better way to do this is actually parametric typing, which I quite like. So that's what you told me to do, and I didn't understand why that helped. So the reason for what what happens here is um, inside the curly braces, it says something here is a function is has some type a uh -huh. and i don't know what that type is i will know when you create it. and so when you create it if i pass it here it looks at 1.0 it looks at the type of 1.0 and it sees ah it's float 64 a becomes float 64 and so now a the little a is required to be big a which is float 64. Yes. So like at compile time, it says, it looks to see what the possible inputs to something are, and then compile separate versions of the struct for each possible configuration of types that you see. It's not that eager, but yeah, but it's just, it, it, so if, it, if you give it a, if you give it a float 64, it'll compile the path for float yes. 64. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. But it happens before, or it happens at compile, not runtime? Um, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, how do you do parametric typing with multiple types? Just, I don't know. Um, yeah, just just on the other side of commas, so B. Great. Yeah, and then you'd have like you know, little B, big B, something like that. Okay. Is there any so? But you subset the real. Yes. So so uh, typically, if these are done correctly, your AD duals, right? So like the forward diff dot dual and your reverse diff dot dual, they they end up being subtypes of real. So you can do. Um, so, but that that doesn't bother it. It doesn't bother it. Okay. At least. I think it depends on the, your AD implementation, um, but you can also just do like I think number, right? It's like it's like a way to do this in general. I you know I don't know how much you need constraints. I think it's general generally better to just disambiguate between whether it's an array or whether it's scalar, right? So like if you just do abstract array, 
right? This will catch weird compile time errors where you're like trying to pass a scalar to something that should be an abstract array. Should I think of this as the good practice way to define a struct in any case? Is there ever any reason that I would want a hard cast? No, I, I don't think like, if you can if you can write your struct in very general types, it's considered to be not only kind to you, but also kind to other people. Um, just because like sometimes you may just be passing weird stuff and you want the compiler to be able to infer what the type is. Um, there's very few times where you want to pass in like hard coded types. And sometimes that's like where you have other structs that you've designed that are like very intentional. So um, is there any benefit? So the distinguishing between arrays and numbers, I guess, helps the compiler allocate space. Is that the idea? Um, no, because parametric typing handles that anyway, right? So if I just like left out, left this out. Yeah. So why would I ever just so, so there's two reasons. One is for you as the programmer. So like when you're writing code and you have types that um, define your intention when you for the struct when you created it, having the type constraints on there makes it so that you can't shoot yourself in the foot by putting a float 64 in a place where there's supposed to be an array. The other reason to do that is because it can help the compiler disambiguate sometimes. Um, it, like when you're dealing with parametric typing, it's a little harder to find those, those edge cases, but um, just like actually doing the constriction can help you kind of make sure that things go to the right spot. Yeah, okay, these are good questions. Okay, other people? No, okay. All right. I don't know what I was trying to show here. That's something. We'll just ignore that. Oh, okay. That's oh, all right. I know what's going on here. All right. So I wrote this, I wrote this function G that accepts X. And I've done uh what uh I've done I've done the, the bad thing here, right? And I want you to see here this is the bad thing. Right, I've overly restricted my function to just float 64. There's no reason for me to do this, right? There's like, you know, like there's not, okay, there's not a lot of reasons for me to do this. Sometimes it's useful to type constrict, but here it's just not, not important, okay? And so this function is just a really simple numerical operation. Um, and note that these functions will throw an error if you give X that's not float 64. So like they're kind of handling this a little bit for you. Um, and it's not obvious you're getting like multiple dispatch and benefits. Anyway, it's the whole thing. Um, so this this function is is just kind of a weird basic one that I, that I wrote out that has kind of an interesting derivative here. Okay. All right. So let's take this derivative here. And this 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 works. What the hell's going on, dude? I'm so confused. Because you already have a G in your space. Now. Yes. Yes, I do. Yes. Oh man. G basic. Cameron, Cameron did it. Cameron did it dumb. Okay. So part of part of this is that later on, this is why I hate Jupyter notebooks so much, is that later on I defined a G that has the same name that I fixed. So I didn't do the type constraint. Okay. So this is this is a this is this is multiple dispatch and Jupyter shooting me in the foot. Okay. So now when I take this derivative here, um, I'm basically getting uh, there is no method matching G basic. And the type, when I look at the actual call stack, I see it's forward diff dot dual, forward diff dot tag type of G basic, float 64. Okay. So what it's done, what forward diff has done is it's taken my input of 1.0, put it in a box, and tried to pass it into the function. But because we've gated the function by putting the type constraint float 64, it throws an error because there's no method that can handle that. Okay. So this is what happens when you like are over eager about type constraining things. It's very easy to feel smart and fun when you do colon colon plus 64, um, but it's, you know, you're only hurting yourself and everyone else you love. Okay. All right. So we're going to see now how to fix this. So the super basic way is just take your type constraint out. Like this is actually a really nice way to solve this problem. Um, because we know that X is probably some numeric type. The compiler is just going to accept some numeric type and it's going to throw it into cosine square root absolute sine x squared. And it'll handle all of that stuff just fine because all of those things, all of those functions, cosine square root absolute and sine, are built to handle arbitrary number types, 
right? They are not as tight and trained as your function is. And so you just kind of want to be able to like kick them down and let those functions handle it if they can. Okay. So when you take this derivative, you get a real number, which is nice. Okay. So only annotate types when strictly necessary. Like, and one of the best ways to do this is like, just don't annotate anything unless you know for sure you're trying to get the compiler to go to a specific function to use multiple dispatch. Um, another good way to like decide when it's time to annotate a type is if you're getting an ambiguity error. So if you get a method ambiguity error, then you can start annotating types. And Julia will actually give you like a nice little recommendation. Yeah. Isn't it a whole thing like if it's a macro warning type or whatever, just things get really slow if it doesn't know what type things are and it does any. Or like it, it, it like. Uh, that's a that's a that's a little bit of diff, different error or a different issue. Like you want um, at code warn type, basically what you want it to happen is you want the type of the output to be a function of the type of the input. And so basically, there's kind of a different path for every type that, that runs through. And so, you know, that's like a, that's just kind of a mildly different issue. Like if you just leave everything type unconstrained um, on the input side, it basically does the work for you of copying that function and doing the different type constraints on your behalf. But, but sometimes things end up stay, staying as like um, inputs can be of type any and everything boxed and then it's like really slow, right? Um, inputs can be of type any, but it doesn't, it, it um, for any sort of particular, like, so if you have a vector of type any, yep. that's bad. Yep. You should not be having a vector of type any at any point. But if you're passing like scalar values or heavily typed things, it's not really an issue. Yep. The, 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 like, the original sin there is having some kind of vector that's of type any because it makes all the little tiny functions that touch vectors all, all, all slow and bad. Um, like type constraints on the input are like definitely not the place to pick up performance. Yep. Yeah. But they are a nice place to catch where you are making errors. So if you put vector float 64 and you get a vector any, you know that somewhere upstream you're making a bunch of errors. So that's kind of a, one of the benefits of it. Or vector real, I guess, would be kind of the, the nice way to do this. Vector subtype real. Uh, let me type that out so you can see what I'm like. So if I do vector, this is not a this is not a vector value function. I'm just kind of doing this as an example. Right, so if you do this, then then this will kind of like permit you to do kinds of. Um, it just says it just rules out vector any. Yep. Okay. Okay. All right. So this is a this is another way to do this. Is you know I'm just constraining it to be real rather than any, and this this kind of rules out a bunch of a bunch of inputs that we don't want. Good question, Brad. Okay. So. Forward diff does the exact same thing that forward diff does, but it uses this reverse diff dot track real struct rather than forward diff dot dual. Um, and so it has the exact same problem. So if you're using reverse diff, make sure that you have very you know broad broad types. Okay. All right. Any questions about kind of the typing stuff? Another thing that I've I've struggled with is like sometimes. I want to pass in a function, like pass into a function input, and then like a pre-allocated array. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's coming up. Okay. Like a pre-allocated array for your output. Uh, uh, like no, like a pre-allocated array used for intermediate steps of the calculation, and that creates problems. Oh, so you have like, so you have some inner function f, and you're trying to take the gradient. But f uses an array, yeah, of uh, like a buffer. Yeah. Um, oh, that one's interesting. I think you probably end up if you really need the intermediate array, you might need to like. Um, yeah, I think that would be a thing that calls for like an adjoint, like a custom adjoint. Like you might have to write your own rule if you really need the intermediate calculation. Or alternatively. Actually, here's a word you could do. Closure. Yeah, you could make you could make a closure around it. So you have you make a so you have an inner function f. This is the thing you're trying to optimize, and then you make a g outside of it, and the g accepts your parameters, and all you do is make uh, you just 
here. Actually, then I can do parametric typing. To yeah, so then you the do. Number, right? the right thing. Yeah, That's so you number. function g of x, and then you do buffer equals, you know, zeros type of, or el type x, and then you know, buffer. Yeah, and then, then you call, you know, function f. Yeah. Okay. There's also only if you need the types, right? Um, what do you mean? Like, why did you need to, to do the EL type? Um, so, so, um, so, so, so the problem the is, the, is, the, is the input ends up being a dual, and then I'm doing an intermediate calculation on the input, uh -huh. which gives you a bunch of duals. But if I'm putting it into the buffer, it's like, wait, the buffer is a bunch of float 64. It's like, you can't put a dual yeah. in here. And then it complains. There's no function float 64 of dual. Okay. Yeah. So you want, the, you want the function to accept an arbitrary input. So you want to be able to call it with both 64s and, and do like the normal, normal routine. But you also want to be able to run it uh, through AD, which means anytime, anything that touches any of the inputs or is a result of the computation of the inputs needs to be able to you know, handle that same type. Um, and just calling like zeros by default, this is vector 464 or, you know, array, array yeah. 64. I think I had an issue like that with indices also. It has some sort of weird function. It has like an iterative, mm -hmm. iterative thing and it, it only accepts yeah. integers as it as. Yeah. yeah. Basic, basically, any, any function where you do something like this, where you call zeros um, and you make it, oh man, I'm so sorry. I need to stop, stop bumping that. Um, Anytime where you basically where you're doing this zeros call zeros defaults to float sixty four so el type is your best friend here so el type so for example if I do this el type here what it does is it looks at the the type of the array the, the values inside of the array and uses that um, to type whatever your your you know array is. so anytime you preallocate something this is a very good way to to handle the typing that's a that's an interesting problem you have you have fun problems. Yeah. Um, okay, so with the like 13 minutes before our break, I'm going to kind of kind of dig into our like in place derivatives, right? So this is this is one of the things that that um, it's actually not only good in Julia, it's kind of good in computation in general, um, where you basically have some kind of buffer that you use to store intermediate calculations, and um, it's a you know it's just a very handy tool to have to speed everything up because you don't have to do as many memory allocations, which are incredibly costly. Terms of time. Okay, so I'm just going to use gradient here. I've been using forward dip dot derivative, but I'm just going to assume everything's the right values and just kind of use gradient instead because it's a little more common. Okay, all right. So what I've done here is I've written something called fun function. It just accepts a parameter vector, um, apparently of like three, length three, and it just does some like stupid math on it. Okay. Now I'm going to call the you know the gradient version we've been doing before. I'm going to just call the gradient. You'll note there's no exclamation point here. This is what is called the allocating version. The allocating version basically recreates this work buffer every time. So it's it's a it's a lot. Uh, it it incurs memory costs because it has to to allocate the result return value result. Right, which is a length three vector because it's the same size as the input. Alternatively, if I'm going to be calling a lot of gradients and I just need somewhere to stick them for a little bit, I can create a buffer. And so here I've created this buff vector, which is zeros of length three. Note that these can be actual float 64s because these are outside of our automatic differentiation. Um, and then I'm going to call gradient here, but I'm going to add the, the exclamation point here. The bang. And the first argument is now no longer the function, it is our buffer. So now I can call the gradient with three arguments the buffer, the function, and the place to value the gradient map. And what it'll do is it'll basically put all of the results inside of that buffer. Okay. And so gradient bang does not do the allocation step. And that's really important. So if you're calling this, if you're calling forward just that gradient like a bajillion times, you don't want it to do this allocation a bajillion times. You can do the allocation once and then just keep overwriting the values inside the buffer. And this is really, really, this is a very good way to gain a bunch of free speed. Okay. And then we can just verify that the results are the same. So buffer and result, 
are equal to one another. My, my, my general information on this though was that I found the gains to be small because I'm not very good at programming. And so my fun function itself was making a bunch of allocations at each step. Yes, that's, and so, yeah. if, you, if, if this ends up being like a really nice kind of like, like if you are, if your function, your fun function is fast, yeah, you know, if it's yeah, then it then it kind of matters, right? Your your memory allocation time is actually quite large for the gradient calculation, um, and this also matters a lot if you have huge gradients. So if you have you know thousands of parameters, then it's actually an incredibly good idea to do the pre allocation. But you know, if you've got I don't know six variables, it's not clear to me that that buffer and forward dip are giving you all this, a, a whole lot of benefit. Yeah. Um, so this is valuable for performance if you run a lot of derivatives or um, if you just have like a lot of parameters. Okay. So let's say we wanted this, the gradient of this function across a grid of P, right? So I'm just gonna make this little, this grid here. Um, and I'm gonna kind of unwrap them. So basically this is going to be P grid here. I'll show you like, the first couple of values of this so you can see what it looks like. All right, so basically this is what it's going to look like. We're just going to evaluate it, uh, evaluate our fun function here at every point in P grid. All right, so I've got this function. This is just a, a nice little wrapper function. And all it does is calculate the gradient Without doing the pre-allocation, no buffer. This is this is the using the allocated version of gradient um, with no bang. Okay. So I've pre-allocated the the return vector, right? This is where I'm basically going to stick stuff, um, and then I'm just going to kind of stick the result in here and return it. Okay. And then I have the buffered version of the gradient, and I'm doing a little bit of an extra trick here. Um, so this is identical to the to the previous function, with the exception of two things: gradient bang here, because I'm calling the not out the mutating version, and as a buffer, I'm passing what's called a view of grads. And basically, what I'm going to do is in the ith row of grads for and all the columns, I'm basically going to stick the result of the gradient. And a view is a way of basically passing by reference. It's not, it doesn't actually copy that row and pass it on. It gives you the location of that array in memory. Okay. And so when you give a gradient bang this view, it can basically say, oh, okay, I can see where it's supposed to go. It just places everything right where it needs to be. Okay. Quick question about that. Sure. I know with data frames, which is a little separate thing, there's a bang shorthand for this. Mm -hmm. Is there an, is that just uh, unique to data, to data frames? Um, library, or can you also use it for uh, just generic arrays in Julia? Um, in Julia, the, the, the bang actually has no meaning at the language level. Okay. It doesn't change anything, but by convention, all the Julians have agreed that if it has a bang, it is a mutating function. Oh, it sorry. mutates I one meant, or more of its arguments. I meant something slightly different, which is like, say I have a data frame, mm -hmm. and the data frame, open bracket, bang, comma, index. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Like, by, that'll do by reference. If I want to add mode, yeah, modify a column or yeah, something. Or that's a special it. thing. That's yeah, a, okay. a data frame sure special that thing. That yeah, okay. okay. Yeah. So view, if I wanted to do that, but for just generic arrays, act use the view function. Yeah, I think, I, you know, I, I my sense is that it's, that it's a data frame specific thing, but now I'm not sure. I'll have I mean, to look I, that I, up. I would believe it is, because I, I haven't seen anyone else, but I would. Yeah. I thought view was a data frame thing. Do you think it was also a data frame thing? I thought so, yeah. They, thought they, they have their own implementation. Yeah, I've only ever seen it there. You, but I would believe that it exists, I guess. Yeah, the, this, this view is at the, the delay level. Okay, wait, I'm still very confused about what's going on here. So view from data frames, I thought the whole point was that you're not uh, cutting things open, you're just, you're not modifying uh, an existing object or replicating it. Instead, you're just sort of looking into it. And, and when I say view from data frames, what I really mean is like view from pandas. <laughs> I think that's what it does. Um, yeah. This is what does this view do? So this view. Um, here, let me. Get, I'll give you. I'll give you the counterexample here. 
So this one right here is kind of what you might be inclined to do. Um, and I'm pointing here to the second line. Sorry, I just set a frame here. Okay, so this this line right here is is kind of what you might be inclined to do. However, in Julia, what happens is this line here, grads grads i uh, grads bracket i comma colon bracket. What this does is create a copy of that row. And so what you're doing is you create a copy. You're like, hey, I have this shiny new buffer for you. You give it to gradient bang. Bang says, okay, I'll put all the answers there. That's not stored anywhere, right? It just disappears. So when you do this, it, you're giving it a copy of an array that dies the second after this function is called or when the garbage collector comes along. So what view does is it says, I don't have a shiny new box for you. I have an old box, um, but I want you to put your answers in row two areas one, two, or columns one, two, and three. And so having the view here is actually, um, is uh, handing the map to the gradient function of where to put it. Cool. Does that help at all? Very much, yeah. Okay. And then why are you defining grads outside? Is there any reason? Like, uh, that's just so that I can, it? Um, so this is, this is just a little bit of a pre-allocation trick, right? So if I know the size of my, if I know the size of my outputs, it's really nice to pre-allocate it. Um, the alternative here is like pushing on into array or whatever, but because I know it's going to be um, like P grid rows, I can just pre-allocate it and dump everything in the where it needs to go. And sorry, last last question. Okay. And then so the reason you're buffering is because you're trying to compute the gradient over a matrix where you want to compute the gradient row wise, um, but across the columns one row at a time. Mm -hmm. um, that wouldn't. Uh, you wouldn't. The, there's no other way to do that other than with the buffer. Or what is what, what is is there an alternative? Um, which thing are we talking about when we say buffer? So what you're calling a buffer here is you're saying I have a, a matrix. Sure. Yeah. Let's say like a three by five matrix. Okay. And I have a function that's five dimensional. The six a vector that's five dimensional as an input. Okay. I want to value with the gradient of each row. Yeah. And the function that you've written, I think, does that. Yes. Assuming we are using rows correctly. I think that's what, how it's written. Yeah. Okay. Um, the reason that you're buffering is that um, you your function is five dimensional and you mm -hmm. don't want to conflate things. Yeah. Is there any alternative to buffering? Is, like, is the only thing that you're showing us here the idea that you can like pre instantiate your grads and then fill them in one at a time as opposed to creating. Uh, yeah, like the the uh, the other alternative I may have is like something like this where I do like um, something like this where I like create an, an array that's empty and then you push onto it and then I push onto it with you know push whatever. Got it. Uh, this happens to be really, this is generally a bad idea. Yeah, pre like, is always better. Um, okay. pre just pre allocating is, is always better. So you don't have to, because you don't have to constantly resize your array. So Julia is pretty good about this, usually, but um, like this is just kind of a good, basically, anytime you're calculating a bunch of values and you know exactly how many you're going to calculate, it's wise to create a bucket to put them in the end. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah. But, okay. All right. So I want to show you um, uh, basically the, the difference in computation here. Um, oh, these are kind of weird benchmarks. Hold on, let me see if I can rerun that. Um, but basically buff, doing this buffer grad is way, way nicer because you don't have to do the, the allocation every time. I don't know that I should have rerun this, but this is the worst part. This laptop I got in 2014. So. It's it's still hanging on. It was still what like two x faster. Yeah. A bit more than that. Yeah. Um, oh, this is very frustrating. I'm so sorry. I just had to have a better benchmark. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll 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 press on for a second, and we'll we'll go back to it in a second. Um. So the 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 rule of thumb about when to choose forward diff and when to choose reverse diff is if you have oh wait. We're at the top of the hour. I'll stop here. This is a good time to wait for the benchmark to roll in. And uh, just before we pause here, it is significantly faster, right? So it's about 2x. Um, actually, a little, yeah, about 2x. So the bottom one here is the estimate for doing the buffered version. So 
27 milliseconds on, on in the median versus 1.275 seconds in the median for doing the, the simple version. So if you're doing a lot of calculations, it's really nice to just have an array and dump things into a buffer. So that, that's free speed, um, especially if you're doing this like hundreds of millions of times. Yes. I guess so when is it situated? Like usually we, I don't know, like typically I feel like I would use gradients just for optimization. Mm -hmm. We don't know how a priori how many calls I'm going to do anyway. Yes. So this is only helpful for cases where I like want to actually compute a gradient to know the values. No, because uh, we'll show that I'll show you how to do this in opt-in. Like there's a bunch of like ways to do this in opt-in where um, you can just pass along the same buffer to your every gradient evaluation. You don't need to know a priori, you just you know have to know, have to be able to look at whatever the gradient is at any point in time. Yeah. And if you only about allocate one buffer, that's actually pretty nice. And I guess you did a maximum number of iterations anyway. So you yeah. allocate that many and you might not use the whole thing. Well, in that case, you don't actually want to allocate. So if I'm doing opt-in, I'm just like um, I'm going to look at the gradient. You're just passing through an, a gradient object. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'll, show, I'll show you an example. Yeah, yeah, It'll make yeah. more sense in a bit. Okay. Um, all you right. Might not, you might not need to view the view. Yeah. yeah. You do the buffering in the sense that you do in place gradient. Yeah, exactly. No no view required, no like gradients array, just, you know, a single like three three vector. Yeah. But also the buffering, like, you don't have to use it for gradient anytime you want to do it. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. For yeah. That, that I do, but the, uh, yeah. Okay. Excellent. Okay, um, why don't we come back at uh, 10 to our back. Okay. All right. Hello again, everyone. Um, we're going to kind of kind of press on here. Um, any questions from like kind of the last step before we move on here? Okay. All right. So this section here, I'm basically going to tell you to show you when and why it's the case that forward dip and reverse dip end up being, you know, good options in different types of settings, okay? So um, people generally recommend forward dip for gradients uh, with less than 100 parameters, right? So you just basically look at how big your gradient is, and if it's over 100, probably reverse dip. If it's under 100, maybe forward dip. These are incredibly crude heuristics. Um, so don't, so don't, take, don't take this as a gospel. It's just kind of a rule of thumb. Um, and they also differ a little bit in implementation. So reverse dip, I think, I, I would say probably in general has this like feeling of being a little more like um, kind of performance oriented because you can do all this like tape compilation and stuff that's that's quite nice, right? Like gradient reverse diff comes with like some additional features that is, that I really like. Um, so I'm, I'm going to show you some 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 examples when reverse diff is preferred to forward diff. Okay. All right. So. I have this function here called big function, and it accepts just some arbitrary vector p. Yeah, I have these great, great functions names. I'm, I'm, my marketing skills are amazing. Um, all it does is cut them in half. It cuts this vector in half, and it puts the you know the first half in something called alphas, and then the second half it puts them in something called betas, and then it just returns the sum of the alphas times the sine of the cosine of the betas. So this is just like a this is just some arbitrary function that accepts some weird inputs and has presumably some very strange gradients. Okay. This is a nonsense function, right? This doesn't mean anything. It's just a, an example of like, you know, something that I can scale up the size of the input so that I can show you what happens when I make this input very large. Okay. So and then I'm going to draw just some random numbers. These are going to be random inputs. So the first one, x plus two, just has you know two inputs. This is a very small dimension problem, and then it goes all the way up to x s ten k that has ten thousand parameter inputs. Okay, this is like the, the gnarly huge one. All right, and I'm going to show you some of these these gradients here, or the the performance uh, of things. And the first one here is that you can see on the top. This is the the sample the the benchmark for forward dip. Median time 1.175 that mic microseconds. Yep. Yep. Me last. I keep, I keep getting confused. So microseconds. 1.175 microseconds. Almost. Uh, what is that? Like 150 times slower is reverse dip. Okay. So this is a two-parameter problem, and you're getting 150x speed up by using forward dip. Right. Just so much less record keeping. So forward dip 
small dimensionality problems, really good. Okay. This starts to this starts to fall apart as we scale up the dimensionality. So I'll I'll, I'll show you this with XS10, which is a 10-dimensional problem. And forward diff is still pretty fast, you know, like it's you know, it's not 150x, maybe like 75x, but it's still significantly faster. Okay, so 3.26 microseconds compared to 151 microseconds. Okay. And when I go up to 1K, uh, now we start seeing some problems. Okay. So now we're not actually comparing microseconds to microseconds. We're, forward diff has actually completely rounded the corner and is now garbage slow. Right. So 1,000 parameters, it takes um, medium time forward dip 3.37 milliseconds, right? That's 3,000 3, microseconds, I think. Don't quote me on that, okay? Versus 209 uh, microseconds for reverse dip. So reverse dip significantly faster with 1,000 parameters, okay? And you'll note that actually reverse dip scales very well, right? So it goes from 150 microseconds to 150 microseconds, and it only jumps to 209 microseconds when we go, we add an extra, uh, uh, you know, 900 parameters, okay? So it handles the scaling very well. And I'll show you the, like, ridiculous version of this, where forward diff takes 452 milliseconds, and uh, reverse diff has only taken 730 microseconds, right? So this is like a hilarious speed difference. So there's basically this kind of quadratic curve where at one point it's all just, you know, very small parameters, forward dip, a lot of parameters, reverse dip. Okay. And this is like this is like very stark, very obvious. Okay. Is there any intuition for why reverse dip is better for higher dimensional problems? Um, the reason for this is, you know, as best as I can explain it, because I, I personally don't think I have a great intuition for this, is like. Um, when you are calculating, uh, I did already mention it, but like, I, I don't know that I have a good answer that's like meaningful enough to, to refer back to, but basically you, I think the record keeping is substantially smaller. So when you're doing reverse dip, I think you only have to keep track of how one parameter affects the output. Whereas if you do a uh, forward dip, you have to basically keep track of how every parameter impacts every other parameter, basically, as you go from the outside of the function to the inside of the function. Um, but it's a good question, right? It's, you know, I, I, this is, I'm not like a, like a, like a master of the, the, you know, the little tiny fiddly bits of the inside of automatic differentiation. Um, I'm just like a, a use it guy. So sorry, that's not a great answer. I know it's super not underwhelming, um, but I think that's my sense of, of the, the problem. Okay. So reverse diff for bigger models. This is why reverse, like reverse mode differentiation is like, Durger in uh, neural networks, right? Because they're huge parameter spaces. Um, you don't really want to use like forward diff for those. But if you're, you know, working in like fairly common, like a lot of economics models actually have a fairly small parameter spaces, you know, typically, you know, like, you know, less than 20 or 30 or whatever, if you're doing like, you know, some, some kind of fun, fun little problems, because you really only care about a couple of problems, a couple of the parameters. So forward diff is probably actually going to be. Um, a lot more useful for economists than is reverse diff. Um, but again, it kind of depends on what you're working on and what your problem is. So that's the takeaway. Reverse diff, big model. Um, I wanted to I wanted to throw this on here just in case um, you're like some kind of like troglodyte caveman type. Um, you know, we have we, we, if you need to take finite, if you need to take a derivative and you don't want to use AD or you can't use AD because sometimes you can't, um, sometimes you need to do the old school like finite differences approach. Okay. And so finite differences is the brute force computational way of getting the derivative or grading or whatever. And so the way that this works is you basically calculate your function really, really close. You, do, you basically just gently perturb. Um, your x, you basically calculate it on either side of the, the function point that you're evaluating, and um, you can kind of interpolate what the derivative should be by comparing those two. Um, and so Julia has actually two very good finite difference packages. Uh, the one I'm, I kind of prefer is finite diff because it's a little faster. Um, 
the other one is finite differences.jl. Um, but I, I prefer finite diff. So if, if this is something that you need to use, it's, it's here. Um, so you can add it here if you want to, you know, just add finite diff. I'll give you just an example of the usage. Um, the, 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 the kind package maintainers at finite diff have actually made it such that they export finite underscore difference underscore gradient so that you cannot get it mixed up with dot gradient from reverse diff and forward diff. Okay. So anytime you're typing it, it's, it's actually finite underscore difference underscore whatever the thing you want. So Jacobi and Hessian, whatever, finite diff has it. Okay. Um, and they end up being fairly close to each other. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually storing the, uh, apologies. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm making a data print here and I'm just kind of printing it out and showing the, uh, the difference between the finite differences column, which is in the first column, the automatic derivative and their difference. And they're basically, you know, one E negative nine of each other, right? So this is, or one E minus negative eight, I don't know. They're pretty close to each other. That's a very good tolerance. Um, but finite differences is also really slow because you have to calculate your function at least twice on either side of the point you're trying to calculate. And I don't know if that's a, their exact implementation, but finite differences are generally very slow, but you can differentiate literally anything, right? That's the really nice benefit. If you're using a Julia package that calls to something else like C or C++ or whatever, finite differences will just give you a derivative because all you're doing is checking what the function is a little bit on either side. Yeah. So how does all of, I think we briefly talked about this before, but how does all, how does all of this work with like, well, particularly things that aren't differentiable everywhere, but are like sub-differentiable? So like- Like within a region. Like if there's a, yeah, or like if there's a kink or something, mm -hmm. like uh, sort of technically like- How does it differentiate absolute value? Yeah, like what- um, Yeah. Uh, well, finite difference, is, yeah, no, yeah, well, like, like for, for either, yeah. Auto diff. How does auto diff handle absolute value? Is it, there's just a rule that says. There, yeah, there's just a rule. Why that is bigger than zero? And yeah, exactly. Zero and, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, yeah. exactly. It, it's just it's yeah. just conditional logic, right? Okay. So, so it, it just kind of goes through. Um, it, you can basically everywhere. Like what's what's happened? The way that automatic differentiation works at its core level is that all computation is just a bunch of little tiny primitive operations, right? So yep. adding things, we know that there's no real derivative there. Yep. We know that there, or there is, but not the same, thing, depending on what you're differentiating. Oh my God, camera doesn't know math. Um, if you're multiplying something, then you know you, there's very simple rules, right? So um, you basically just lower, keep lowering yourself until you hit a primitive operation. And then somebody's pre-written what the derivative is for that function. And then you just take that, multiply it all the way up as you go outside of the function. But again, right. if I try to auto-diff something with a jump, like that's fine, right? That's like that. First of all, it depends on where you are in the jump. Yep. And second of all, it depends on um, whether or not you're actually on that jump exactly. Yep. Right. So if your if your jump happens at exactly one, yep. and you're at nine point nine 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 nine, you might actually just get the original derivative pre jump right. right? So. Um, yep. Yeah. I don't know if that helps you at all. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Is there a way to use four diff to define derivative rules? Um, yeah. So you, so I would go take a look at chain rules core. Um, or chain, yeah. So chain rules core is basically how it is that you define um, derivative rules. And in your case, if you're using forward diff, you would use F rule. Um, and so basically, what you do is you basically define make a new function that returns the actual output of the function and then the corresponding um, derivative of that, of that function. Um, but it, it's like, it's, I, I've kind of deferred a lot of the like writing your own rules thing because it's kind of like a huge pain. Um, it looks like you, I needed to like recompile the entire package or something, but I don't need to do that. I don't think you do. You can you can basically write your own at the top of your code, right. and it'll just kind of once you have a, a correct rule, it'll just make all of your derivatives go through. You. If you send me an email on it, we can work, I can help you out with that, because um, nobody should have to go through writing custom <laughs> custom rules alone. Um, okay, 
I'm gonna like scoot this. Oops, that's too scooted. All right. Well, all right, cool. So basically what I'm doing here is um, I'm just kind of computing. I'm just showing you the computational costs that you incur from using finite differences. Finite differences are great, especially if you're using like, um, if for example, you are using a Julia package that calls like a C or C++ or Fortran package, you cannot auto dip through that because the, you know, the C package or whatever is not going to know how to handle this weird forward dip dot tool thing. And so, you know, the way you typically do this is if you, you know, need to derive, you know, take the derivative across like some optimization routine, you can use finite differences and it'll all go through and you'll get some kind of nice gradient that hopefully resembles something real. Um, that's, that's all I do with finite differences. I just like cross my fingers and hope that it, it looks normal. Um, and you can see here that basically finite difference it's like two or three times lower. Um, and I, I suspect this scales pretty poorly with dimensionality, but I haven't checked that. Okay. All right, so this is, this is, this is kind of about Lulu's question here. Um, um, so I mentioned these, these rules here, right? So basically everyone defines these rule, gradient rules and derivative rules for the fundamental primitives of computation, sums, products, exponents, et cetera. So sometimes you want to differentiate a function, but you either can't, you, you know, your, your code is new. It doesn't have some kind of uh, understandable primitive computation, or it, you just can't actually AD through it, right? So the first example here is you may call a non-Julia function, right? So this is like calling some C package that some dude wrote in 1974 that happens to be used by everyone and their mom, okay? Um, evaluating the derivative with AD can be costly because there are some times where um, you know the exact analytic derivative and um, it might be like the derivative you've taken of like some kind of on, like uh, like the envelope condition or something like this right where you kind of know something you know the derivative at a point that's very costly to computate like very costly to get to sometimes it's actually easier to calculate the analytic derivative so sometimes you just want to hard code that inside step AD entirely um, some expressions may not actually impact the return value. So sometimes it's actually really nice to just like shut those off entirely and rewrite a custom adjoint that just cuts those out um, so that you don't actually have to evaluate a bunch of, a bunch of expressions. Um, some functions are too type constricted. I'm looking at you distributions.jl. Um, this, is, this has been a huge pain for the Turing developers for a long time. And we, we ended up writing a little side package or not we, other people, I didn't, I was involved in the AD side. Um, but basically distributions is really tightly type constrained. So when you try to take gradients with auto diff, it ends up uh, not going so good. Um, and you might be working with like custom types and custom algebra and like you're in some kind of weird world and there's no rules. Yeah. Did you, reach out to the people at distribution jail to see if they would be willing to try and help re-architect things. I know I know this is this has been a huge ongoing discussion. Um, like there is uh, part of the problem is that distributions is so fundamental now yep. to the Julia community and it's really hard to kind of reconfigure things. Um, there have been like some kind of upstarts of people trying to do stuff like like uh, Chad Share has a really nice package called Measure Theory that's like pretty fast and a little more AD friendly. Um, but um, so they aren't willing to make the type less restrictive while keeping the API the same. I don't remember the exact discussion. I know that some type constraints have ended up being relaxed, but just like there's so much code. Like it's a big it's a big overhaul, and like I think people are just kind of. I, I don't know. I don't know exactly. I haven't followed it very closely in a while. Um, but yeah, if you have to define an AD rule, please go to the documentation for chain rules for. That's like this is where this is where you should should do it. The, the Julia community has kind of rallied around chain rules as like a way a, a formal way to define rules for all the AD systems, and so um, they're kind of getting more and more AD systems are coming online to using chain rules, and so I would. Definitely focus on like learning how to do that if you need to write very weird custom pullbacks or adjoints or whatever. Okay, but I'm not going to dig into it. And if you have questions about this, please send me an email or um, Google it. Not to sound flippant, but yeah. <laughs> All 
Uh, but I'm also happy to help because I also need to practice more on this. So it would be helpful to have like a use case. Okay. All right, cool. So we're at the, we're at the kind of fun part I think that people really like, which is optimization, right? So we love optimize, optimizing functions in economics. Um, but before I talk about this, is there any questions about AD before I move on? Okay, viewers at home? It's in the chat. Okay. In the chat. All right. All right. Excellent. All right, cool. So um, I think probably most people watching this are like vaguely familiar with optimization. I'm not going to go into like, you know, the rudiments of it, um, but I'm going to, you know, show you, I'm going to help you use your understanding of this that you may have learned from like your first year of your PhD where you suffered and suffered and suffered. Um, and I'll show you how to do this much easier with computation. Okay. So Julia has awesome optimization tools, right? There's like, there are, you know, there are a couple of places where Julia just like stands out like from everything else and it's not even close. Like differential equations is one, one such thing. Um, I think some people would argue that the probabilistic programming stuff is pretty excellent in Julia. But the optimization is like, I would argue a close second um, or uh, yeah, definitely a close second or a very close equal to the PsyML and differential equation support in Julia. Okay. So I'm gonna talk about a couple of these packages. There are, there are many, um, but I'm gonna talk about the two biggest ones that I tend to use in my research and that I know are very popular. So optim.jl, this is the one that like gets you through most things. Like I, I really love Optin. Uh, it's just like very easy. It's you know, it's super straightforward. It has a lot of very good algorithm support. It's pretty fast. Um, and to me, for me, it, it just kind of maps really well into my uh, workflow. Um, the second package I'm going to talk about is Jump, which stands for Julia for Mathematical Programming. And this is like a whole world. Like Jump is like a Jump is is just you know, it's this entire ecosystem. It's basically, a, a, it's what's called a domain specific language for describing mathematical programs. Um, so it tends to look a little, little weird to people. Okay. Um, then there's non-convex.jl and convex.jl and NLOP and, you know, like various packages that talk to like, you know, um, various optimization libraries and things like that. Um, but I'm gonna focus on Optim and Jump. Okay. Um, and I'm also going to recommend Galactic, Op Galactic Optim if you need global search methods and black box optim, if you just like want something that goes. Um, but in general, optim and JUMP kind of get us where we need to go. Okay. So I'm going to put this up first because I think people people need to know when it is that optim and jump are generally preferred. So optim is really good if you have really complicated, super weird nonlinear objective functions. They don't necessarily need to be continuous, um, but they generally have to have continuous inputs, okay? And uh, you can't really have very complicated constraints for Optim. Um, it doesn't natively support it. It supports box optimization, right? So if you, you know, you have one parameter that can be between zero and one or one parameter that can be, you know, only positive, things like that. Um, these, are, these are very simple constraints. Um, but, you know, jump is gen or Optim is generally very good for unconstrained optimization of gnarly op objective functions. Jump, on the other hand, is good for like relatively simple objective functions, right? So this is this is like, you know, matrix operation sums, you know, things that are that are kind of vaguely linear or like close enough to linear, or like quadratic things like that. And it supports significantly uglier variables. So right, if you need to do like integer programming or mixed integer or binary or whatever, um, Jump is actually a really good tool for you. It is also an excellent tool because it, it supports ridiculous amounts of constraints. So if you have a lot of very complex constraints that you need to need to implement, Jump is awesome for you. And I'll show you how to how to kind of use use full advantage of those. All right. Um, and I think I ignore this. Oops, oops. Okay. So let's install Optim, um, and you can do that with these with these lines here if you don't already have it. Look at people like. You know, 30 seconds or so to run this through. They don't already have Optim. And I'm going to start with Optim because I always start with Optim. Um, 
just because like, you know, most problems like have are fairly smooth, you know, their, their, their vector value or their, they have vector inputs um, and they're kind of nice to optimize. And I don't have a lot of constraints. I'm fortunate that I don't have to do a lot of constrained optimization. Um, I don't know how I got so lucky, but I did. Um, all right, I'm gonna assume it's installed for people. Okay. So the main function you're gonna work with in Optin is optimize, right? That's nice and easy to remember, which minimizes some function, right? So that's remember, so like remember that if you need to maximize something, just flip the sign of your objective value, put a negative in front of it. Um, and Optin supports many gradient-free, gradient-required, Hessian-required optimization methods, right? So um, there's a whole suite of really, really cool tools if you go check out the documentation. Um, it covers a lot of different algorithms. Um, some common function signatures that you're going to end up using are optimize. You give it the function in the first spot and then the places to start the optimization. Um, and then sometimes optionally in the third space, you can specify um, the algorithm you want to use. Then I put the keyword argument. If you want to use automatic differentiation, you can just toggle it on and it'll use forward diff on your behalf. Um, there's a bunch of other signatures and Optin that we'll kind of stumble upon as we go along, but these are kind of the big ones, right? Function, place to start, what to use. All right. So I'm going to start with a super, super simple problem. And I'm just going to have this polynomial x squared, right? That's super easy. We know how to optimize this. You can just eyeball it and point, right? I think everybody can kind of minimize this function. Um, but I'm going to show you how to do this with Optin just because I think it's a really nice visual example for us to have. Okay, so we know that the optimum, the, the minima of this is zero, right? It's got a root of zero. So how do we get the how do we get the minimum? And uh, I don't care if you can find the derivative analytically. I'm real proud of you if you can do it at home um, without using Optin. Um, but I'm going to start here with using Nelder Mead, right? And Nelder Mead is an optimization algorithm. It's a simplex method. And it is like the, like Nelder Mead is really great. It's like this, like, um, it's an incredibly reliable 1997 Toyota Camry. Like Nelder Mead can optimize most things and it can optimize really ugly things. And you don't need a gradient. You don't need any of this stuff. It just kind of goes. And that's a really beautiful thing about Nelder Mead. Um, it has really, not very good convergence property that can be quite slow in some cases, um, but it usually works on more or less everything. So it's kind of, it's actually the default in Optim. So if you don't specify an optimization algorithm, it'll use Nelda Mead. Um, so we'll, I'll talk about how to use like some alternative algorithms, but we'll start with the default for now. Okay. So I'm going to start by importing Optim. Then I'm going to find my objective function here, which is just um, uh, X squared. And you'll note that I'm I'm taking the first value of x. This is just because x is x is an array, it's a one-dimensional array. Often does support some univariate optimization methods, but they're a little strange. And I don't think they get used too much. They may, but I, you know, I don't I don't use them. Um, and then I'm just going to optimize it, right? So this function here just says optimize our function f, our target function, starting at 1.0. So that's our that's our initial guess for the the, the minimum. Um, and this line down below that I've commented out is equivalent, right? I've just, all I've added is this Nelder Mead specification, okay? And then I'm just gonna pull out the, the, the minimizer information, okay? So what I found is the minimizer, this is the value that minimizes this function is 0 0.000244, which is pretty close to zero, I would say. You can, you can tighten up the tolerances if you need to. Um, but in general, this is like finding the minimum. And it's also getting our, the, our minimum function value, which is also very close to zero, as you would expect. Okay, so you can also just print out the print out the results of this optimization function. <laughs> Sorry. That's the of the FGX version. Okay, so if you print it out, it'll tell you, hey, it succeeded. It'll tell you what the final objective value is, what the algorithm was. What the convergence measures were used. This is uh, basically sum of squared errors, more or less, or average sum of squared error. And then um, it'll give you some information about how many iterations and function calls and things like that were used. 
Okay. So I'm going to give you guys like a little little demo thing to practice here with opt-in. Um, so we're going to do some maximum likelihood estimation. I love maximum likelihood because it's such a good example for optimization. Um, so let's say we have n data points and we're we've drawn these from some four-dimensional normal distribution, okay, with an unknown mean. And we're just going to assume that the variance is on the identity matrix. I'm going to assume that it's known. We, we know the variance. All we're trying to find is the means. Okay. So we're trying to find a four dimensional array that maximizes the likelihood of our observed data. Okay. So I'm going to say this mu hat value here is the argmin of M the, that sums the log, the log PDF of our data. Um, uh, with the mean n. Okay, so let's use optin and know their mean to find this. Okay, so install the distributions package if you have not already. Um, you're going to need that for this. Um, and I'm going to give you this code here, but I basically want this is going to generate some, some synthetic data for you to work with. And the true mean it gives I give you a true mean here of one, zero, three, and four. There's the code. Um, oh, and you'll have to import. Oops. Yeah, you'll have to import. I import that just above the code I just sent out. Um, and I want you to find mu hat. Find me the maximum likelihood estimate of mu using often. Right. This this should be more or less uh, a two line call. You'll have to write the objective function, right, using this log PDF and the normal m i thing here that I highlighted right here. And then you're going to have to do the optimum call to actually get the optimum. So I'll uh, leave a couple minutes there for people to work on that. And if there's questions in the in the interim, answer those. I'll make this bigger because people on YouTube get mad at me for my font size being too small. A lot of very angry people on YouTube about this. Some of our eyes are already bad. Yeah. Which I, I, I'm perfect. Like the last session, everything, all my text was way too small because I didn't have the slides running. So like it was, it was bad. There were the people were fair. People were right to, to be mad at me. Okay, and uh, one thing this 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 uh, this part of the objective function I've given you, this actually gives you the a vector with a log PDF for every element of data. So if I have a thousand data points, log PDF and the normal data will have a thousand log likelihood values or log PDFs, and you're going to need to sum those because they're log PDFs. You could just add them together. Bottom of the screen is cropped. Oops, sorry. Thank you. Let's totally miss that. I'm trying to make the the, the text size big for the, the YouTube people so they don't get mad at me. Okay. All right. I'm going to start walking through this on my screen here. So I'm going to copy this code over. All right, so I'm going to import, do, my, do my imports. I'm going to make sure I import Optum as well. All right, and I'm going to find my target function here as n, and I'm just going to use log PDF and be normal, and then I'm going to give it the new mean vector that I'm, I'm guessing, and I'm going to give it the uh, identity matrix, and then I'm going to use x's as my input, my data input here. And note here, this is going to be a, a you know, this function has to be scalar to optimize, or at least in this case, you know, for maximum likelihood. Um, so I'm just going to make sure I take the sum of this. And then I'm just going to use 
res equals optimize target. And the initial points that I'm going to do are just zeros four. I'm just going to start out at the at the zero and work my way out, see if I can find a better, better answer. Okay. All right. So let me call my answer here. It's going to do some pre-compiling. This is this is the this is the perennial pain of Julia. Just waiting for things to compile. That's why I feel like if you're like presenting Julia, you need to like have the have the gift of gab and just kind of give your like pitter patter as you roll. Wait. Oh, it's pre-compiling off of array. All right. Hmm. All right. I also presume people are like kind of really long in this. Uh, so this shouldn't be too too uh, too crazy for people to see the answer. All right, reach maximum number of iterations. Oops. Okay. So here here I got a I got a this is the output of my optimization procedure, and you'll note that it says failure. Okay, reach maximum number of iterations, and the objective value is massive, massively negative, and this is because I failed to flip the sign. Right. So so right now it's it's minimizing the likelihood. Uh, which is a, really easy to do. You just propose some kind of ridiculous means. Um, so I'm going to fix this real quick. So I'm going to go back to my target function here. I'll just put a negative sign there. That's it. And then I'll rerun it. Kaboom. Got an answer. And so I can check this with minimizer res or res.minimizer. And that gives me this format element array that's pretty damn close to the true means. Yeah. So that was really, really quick. Um, Neller me didn't need a whole lot of work for this, and we can actually get even more, even more accurate with with gradient methods. Okay. So, any questions about that that implementation? Okay. All right. Let's proceed. All right. Oh, this is my answer. And let me make sure that I. Fix this a little bit. Um, so, so one of the I would say kind of annoying behaviors of Optum is they let you extract the minimizer or whatever the last best value was, even if you didn't actually solve it, even if your optimizer did not converge, right? So this is kind of a problem because if you just kind of like return res dot minimizer for some function without actually checking if you got the solution, you may be tricked into thinking that the numbers you're getting out of this, out of Optum are like real, like real minimizers when they may not actually be, okay? So make sure that you actually have a solution first. Okay, so I, I've, I've um, written this, this little function here that just takes this Rosenbrock function, which is everybody's favorite optimization demo. And I'm using the simulated, simulated annealing algorithm and I'm setting the iterations to a thousand, which is not enough, right? This is this is just not enough for simulated annealing. Um, and so when I run it, I get status failure, right? Okay, so it says it tells me that it's maximum number of iterations, um, and you can see that it's just not not converged. Okay. And unfortunately, I can just go and pull result call result minimizer, and it's fine. It gives me some numbers. These numbers are garbage. They don't mean anything. They're not an optimum. They're just numbers um, that the optimizer happened to stop at. And so if you don't check, you're going to get some really stupid results. All right. So the way that you can do this is calling converged of your optimization result, which basically checks each of the convergence flags. So, so often provides you a bunch of convergence flags. So iteration limit reached tell, gives you a true if you, you know, maxed out on iterations, which is probably a good sign that you didn't optimize anything. It tells you whether your X is converged, X converged, your uh, X is the inputs, F is the output value, G is the gradient. You can have all kinds of convergence checks on these as well, right? To make sure that they, you know, at some point they need to stop moving. So relative tolerance, um, for example, is one of the things you should look at um, that determines when these uh, basically converge. But converged res is the one that checks all of these for you. And basically, you can just use that to determine whether or not you've converged. Okay. All right. 
So we work we work with Miller Mead, and Miller Mead is a really good Toyota Camry um, from the '90s, like Mauve. Uh, but sometimes you want something that's actually much faster and something that gives you nicer convergence and is a lot smarter. And most of those methods need gradients. And so oftentimes you have, or you can get gradients of some objective function. And gradients are really, really useful because they tell you in which direction you should move from some point to get to a better spot. Another mean doesn't have that, that ability, right? Um, and so the, the most common gradient required method is LBFGS. BFGS is like a whole bunch of author names. I don't actually remember their names. The L in LBFGS, LBFGS stands for limited memory. So there is a BFGS algorithm, but it has a higher memory mem memory demands. Um, so LBFGS is typically more common, commonly used one. And basically what it does is it tries to approximate your Hessian using the gradient, and then it moves you, um, moves each input in the direction of the minima implied by the Hessian, this approximated Hessian. So fortunately, it's super easy to just switch to a new algorithm, right? This is you know, pretty common in most, most optimization packages in all languages. Um, you can usually find Nellner need and or LBFGS. These are like kind of industry standards. So here I'm using LBFGS as my, as my third argument here, right? I know I'm constructing it, right? That's what these two parentheses here mean. Like I'm actually creating an LBFGS type. And then I'm just going to, to get some information from it. And you'll note that res minimizer here is ne negative six uh, times 10 to the power of uh, uh, negative 13. Which is much, much, much more precise than our Nelder Mead, right? Nelder Mead gave us like it kind of ballparked us, and then it gave up because uh, it fell within the tolerances. But using the gradient, oh, this should actually say LBFGS. Okay, so this gives us this gives us actually a very nice little optimum. Okay, so it also tends to be faster. Per you know, you need significantly fewer iterations and function evaluations. To use gradients to use gradient methods. Okay. So these are these are generally a really good option. Um, is the Hessian approximated by autodiff? That is a very good question. In this call, no. In this call, it's using finite differences. So if you don't tell it to use autodiff, it will use finite differences. That is a very good question, Benjamin. So if I do this, autodiff equals forward, it'll call forward diff on my behalf. And you'll note actually. It gives us an exact zero. That's not times 10 to the power of negative 13. That's zero. And so having auto diff gives you like really precise answers. And I'll show you how to do this with, with um, um, more precise, uh, a different way of handling gradients. Okay. So this is this is the uh, what Benjamin mentioned, but um, basically. It defaults to using finite differences to calculate gradients, which is sometimes not what you want. Please be aware of that if you're using often. Um, um, and finite differences are, you know, really messy, right? They're they're not always right exactly. And so, if you want to use your like shiny new AD tools, we get exact gradients. And the foolproof way to do this is auto diff equals forward, like I just did. I'll actually fix this so it doesn't confuse the people reading through. Okay. Um, it supports only finite or forward. And if you want to use reverse AD mode, you're just going to have to wait. I'll show you how to do it in a second. Okay. So this is the, the, the exact code from, from before, but using um, you know, Optimus calling auto different uh, forward diff on our behalf. Okay. So um, you can pass in your own gradient function if you want to use a different AD backend, right? So there's a lot of AD backends. In Julia, there's forward diff, reverse diff, zygote, enzyme. Like, there's all kinds of, of things that, that do work to different extents. Um, and the way that Optum supports these is you define a mutating function G, and it's G bang because this function is intended to mutate its inputs. And the first input to this function is big G. And big G is like a vector where you're going to store your gradient. And you just update all the values in G with the values of the gradient um, using the input X. So if you know your analytic gradient, you can type it up here and just say, ah, oh, okay, the first, the first derivative, um, you know, the derivative of the, 
uh, objective value with respect to the first input. That's G1. And then you put whatever you want in there. Okay. So, for example, remember we had this function x squared, right? This is our, our quadratic function. And I can actually just type up the analytic gradient here, right? So, what I'm doing is I'm specifying g bang, I'm giving it an uh, uh, it accepts a gradient vector buffer basically in an x. And all it does is return 2x times whatever the first input is, right? This is just the analytic gradient. You can do this with math, it's nice and easy. Okay. Now, when I'm optimizing it, I can pass my g bang function into the second argument right next to the f. This is the objective function. So objective function, it's gradient. And if you're working in Hessian values and a Hessian required function, you can also optionally add an h function to return your Hessian. And so now this is the exact same thing. Oops. Um, and it tends to be much more exact. You don't need need AD here. Um, okay. So let's suppose we have a, like a much larger gradient, a much larger, much larger model with a gradient that's too hard or too lazy. Calculate by hand. I'm much too lazy, so I just kind of let auto diff do it. And so let's say we wanted to use reverse diff. Right, so this is a huge model. We want to use reverse diff because we have a lot of parameters. Okay. And I'm going to use this kind of maximum likelihood example we just did, but this time I'm going to have a ton of dimensions, good for reverse mode, and I'm going to have a diagonal covariance matrix. So I'm going to have to estimate um, uh, the, the diagonal entries on this matrix as well. Okay. So importantly, you, you know, variance parameters can't be negative, right? So there's a lot of ways to fix this. Um, you, you know, you can take the exponent of the variance and then just retransform them when you have the optimum. Um, or we can use box optimization, which constrains some of the parameters to be positive. Okay. So I'm going to, uh, this is how I'm going to create some data. So here I'll, I'll shrink it and make it a big K, smaller n ish uh, regime. So I'm going to have a thousand data points. And each of these data points is a is a hundred dimensional vector, okay? Which means we have a hundred means and a hundred variances. So the total parameter uh, space of this model is two hundred. So I'm going to generate some random means, a hundred of them. Um, I'm going to generate some random variances, and then I'm just going to uh, create the distribution for this, and then I'm going to draw some random values. Okay. And then I'm going to define up here our log likelihood function. So this is just the, or the negative log likelihood. So this is the sum of the log PDF. And I'm going from you know the first k parameters are I'm going to assume are the means. And then the remaining parameters I'm going to assume are the variances. And then I'm going to define bounds on these parameters. So these are just vectors that specify the upper and lower bounds for all of our inputs. So the lower bounds. Um, I'm going, they're going to be from uh, negative infinity for the mean parameters because they can go as low as they want. They're, they're on the entire real line. Whereas the variance parameters are bounded at zero. So those are the second K parameters. And then VCAT, I'm just smushing those vectors together. So this is the 200 length vector with negative int on the first, first half. And then the second half is all zeros. And then the bottom part here is I'm just going to repeat infinite for 2k, right? Because all the parameters can go all the way up to infinity if they want to. All right. Now, there is a, a new thing that's appeared here. Um, so I didn't talk about this a little too much before, but you can compile the gradient tape when you're using reverse diff. So I use reverse diff dot gradient tape, and I give it the likelihood function, and I give it a lower bound. Oh, yeah, just for the size. So lower bound is actually the size of our, my parameter space. And then I'm going to call the gradient, reverse diff gradient using G. I'm using the bang version of this function. So G is the thing, this thing here is what I'm going to pass to optim. It accepts the gradient that I'm going to mutate with the values of my gradient. It accepts the place to evaluate that gradient at. And then I'm going to basically pass G to this gradient and it's going to dump everything it needs to inside of G. Um, and instead of passing the function to the gradient, I'm going to give it the tape because it's already pre-compiled all the derivatives. And compiling the tape gives you a lot of speed. 
So I just wanted to show people that they can do that. Oops. All right, Cam Cameron made an error. All right. Okay, so our grading is now compiled here. All right, and then I'll optimize them. We'll see how long this takes. Um, the things to note here are I'm optimizing the log likelihood. This is our target function. This is our gradient function that we just wrote. These are the lower and upper bounds for our parameters. This is the initial point, which is one k times two. And then I'm using box minimization, which means I would just wrap f min box around whatever optimization routine I want to use. Cameron, why isn't your log likelihood in place? Um, I don't know that they support in place okay, operations. Yeah. They, I think they do, but I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I have no idea. They, you could make it in place and it's, oh wait, well, it's a scalar function. So it doesn't matter, yeah. It doesn't really matter whether or not it's in place, right? In place helps a lot for like um, uh, array operations. Yeah. Okay. Well, yes. Or rather, I don't think I completely understood the tape thing the first time you explained. Okay. Like, can, can you just explain one more time why, how, like, is this sort of analogous to what we were talking about before about like it's caching something about the computation of the gradients? Yeah. So, so the way to think about the tape is that you have a computation graph for your function and you have a bunch of nodes in there. And so we think of that as kind of the tape where you just kind of, you can kind of unroll that computation graph and you basically keep track of, you know, um, you can basically create a function where you just plug random things into your nodes as inputs and you get just a really nice simple function for what the, what the, the effect is on the output. Okay. And so when you, um, when you ask reverse diff to compile, compile a tape, you don't actually have to go through and re redraw that function every time. So you can basically pre-compile this gradient function. And, is, and sorry, why are you passing in the lower? Um, it needs to know the dimensionality. Ah. So, so this, so the dimensionality happens to be Thanks. length two hundred, a vector of length two hundred. The a simpler way to do this would be like zeros k yeah. or two k. Another question about the log likelihood in place. Mm -hmm. So the in place when you um, does the in place the bang only refer to the output or does it also refer to everything inside? I thought it referred to any any input of the function. Yeah, it can so be anywhere. Can, it's but by convention, it's the first. But um, the reason I ask is if your log likelihood function is computing like a bunch of stuff where it has to keep state. Mm -hmm. I'd rather rewrite it. Uh, I'd rather not reinstantiate all of those intermediate things. Yeah. Do I get the efficiency out of? Uh, so does that work? I think it works. You would probably want to do what we mentioned earlier, where you have like pre allocating buffers before you hit the, hit the inside function. Like, you want to, like, you're like, you're at some point, you're not going to be able to get over the fact that you have to do all, all these allocations inside of your function at some point, right? Your objective function has to do some kind of allocation. But my objective function could have, could just be passing around some arrays, right? Yeah, that's true. And you're like, I guess I'm. I guess I'm not sure. Like, what the? Let's 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 uh, look okay. at some examples later. I think that's okay. Good. Excellent. Okay, so we finally managed to optimize over 94 seconds, um, which is actually pretty good for for this much data and this large a dimension, right? So this is this is pretty gnarly. Okay. All right. So Optim is really good for relatively really easy problems. Um, but sometimes you need to work with a lot of constraints or integer variables or whatever. And so this is when we're going to kind of talk about jump. So jump is technically what's called a domain specific language and, uh, or DSL slang. Um, and so basically what this is, is, um, oh, we're 11 four. We should probably pause before I jump to go into jump. Um, let's come back at like 11. 1120, 1115. Yeah, let's just do 1115. Um, let's pick it back up. Okay, so when we left off, we just kind of finished uh, working with Optum, and so now we're going to kind of turn to jump. And 
so jump is a very interesting tool for kind of defining um, moderately complicated optimization problems. Um, and it can be very complicated in terms of the constraint space. Okay. So what, what you do is you write arbitrary problems that are kind of independent of the solver backend. And then jump takes what you've written and it hands it off to some particular solver, right? And so there are many, many solvers for all kinds of complicated problems. There's like commercial ones that are very expensive and fancy. And then there's like kind of like free open source ones that are really good, and all kinds of things like this. And jump just kind of unifies them and allows you to hand them off um, as needed. Okay. So jump has like a really amazing community. So this is like, like they're, they're the, their own little world inside of Julia. Um, and they tend to be very, very helpful. So if you have any, any questions about jump or anything like that, you can, you can usually go onto their um, discourse. Uh, they have their own little tag there. They have a Julia channel or get getter channel. I'm not sure. I don't hang out. I don't hang out on the jump channels, but I know that they're, they're bumping. Um, so jump supports all kinds of solvers, like basically anything you can possibly imagine or use. Jump is, uh, has a language that you can use to hook into it. Okay. So some solvers are like faster and may require a license or maybe they're more feature rich. Maybe they can solve a broader class of problems. So like K-Nitro or Nitro, I don't know how to say that, and Garobi, those are two that are like license required. Um, I believe both the Yins and, Sher and Sherlock have access to Nitro and K-Nitro and Kurobi. So in case you want to use these two like really good commercial solvers, they're accessible to you and Jump allows you to talk to them. Um, in case you need to see that and see which solvers to use, um, you can go to the supported solvers thing in the installation guide to Jump and they'll tell you which servers, which solvers you can use and what the name of the Julia package is, what the license is, how to install it, and what uh, class of problems it supports. So like uh, very common ones are CLP. CLP is like real basic, simple linear programming problems. Um, if you need to get like much more complicated, you can do stuff like MOSIC. I don't know, I, I've never actually used MOSIC. SCIP I enjoy. Um, um, it's also really good for like very complicated nonlinear problems. Um, IP opt is also is pretty excellent. I, I tend to use IP opt a lot. Um, but it doesn't support integer programming or mixed integer programming. Um, but anytime you see like this MI parentheses here, that means mixed integer linear programming. So the highs package, for example, is a very good one if you want to do like linear programming with some kind of integer, integer variables. Okay. So basically anytime you're going through this, you just kind of pick a, pick a solver um, that you think fits your, fits your problem type. And usually, I hope that you'll know like whether or not it's it's linear programming, quadratic programming, or like second order cone programming. I don't know what that is. I think the optimization people have been given a little too much free reign um, to make things up, um, but I'm sure there's meaningful distinctions there. Okay. So in order to proceed, we're going to have to install jump. We're going to have to install, I basically picked three solver packages that I'm going to kind of demonstrate here. So CLP, highs, and IPOC. Um, and just kind of let those install. So I'll actually put this in the chat for people who want to follow along. Uh, but I'm going to kind of roll through here. All right. So I'm basically copying this from Jump's documentation. So Jump, Jump has really, really good documentation. So if you need to figure out how to use it, you can just go on there and, and kind of like poke around and see, see kind of what you like. Yeah. So um, suppose we have this like really simple linear program which is basically, we're just gonna minimize 12X plus 20Y, it's a nice linear program, subject to these four constraints, basically. So 6X plus 8Y has to be greater than or equal to 100. 7X plus 12Y has to be greater than or equal to 120. X has to be uh, non-negative, and Y has to be between zero and three. Okay, so this is just a nice, nice, nice simple little problem with some constraints. So we're gonna, we're gonna put this into jump and uh, see what we can get, get, get it to do. So let me walk through what I've written here. So first, I'm going to import jump because we're going to be using a bunch of jump stuff. Then we're going to import CLP. CLP is the solver I'm going to use here because this is a super simple linear problem. CLP is really good at just kind of these like really, really, really nice and easy models. Okay. Then I'm going to create a variable called model 
and I'm going to call big M model on CLP.optimizer. And you'll note, I am not put parentheses on the right-hand side of CLP.optimizer. You don't want to actually create the type. You want to give it a type that it can create for you. So just, you know, basically, if you want to use a different solver, you change CLP here to something else. Like if you were using highs, you just put that there instead, or Garobi, or whatever, right? So, but for right now, we're just going to use CLP. Next, we're going to use this at variable macro that jump exports. That's really nice. And the first ver the first line here. Oh my God! Sorry. Uh, yeah, this is the downside of having a very old computer. It's like keep pumping the HDMI cable and it falls apart. Okay. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying create a variable x and make sure it's greater than or equal to zero. That's that's the uh, allowable parameter space for this for x. The next line here is I'm basic. I'm going to create. Um, Another variable y that has to be between zero and three, and you just specify it like like you would with any inequalities. I'm going to specify the objective function, which is minimize 12x plus 20y, and we're just going to use the same variables that we just created above. You know, nothing special. You're just going to like actually put x 12x plus 20y, and then we're going to add our constraints. So you can actually specify a name for the constraints. Uh, right next to the model. Um, if you don't specify it, they, they, they remain unnamed. Um, but, you know, jump kind of has this like naming constraints thing. I, I, don't, I don't know that I use it that much. Um, I'm sure it's important, but I, I don't know exactly how or why. Um, and then we're just going to specify the constraint, which is 6x plus 8y is greater than or equal to 100. And the second one, which is 7x plus 12y is greater than or equal to 120. Okay. And the really nice thing about this is if you just print the model and you're working in Jupyter Notebooks, it actually does the latex formatting for you, which I thought was really cool. I thought that was slick, so I put that in everywhere just because it's cool. Um, but you can also do like kind of the, the like uglier, uglier print methods, which are like actual text. So, um, but I like the latex because we're in Jupyter and, you know, we have to suffer a little bit through, through using Jupyter. Okay. So um, now we can just solve this and we just call this optimize with the exclamation point model because it modifies the model. And then CLP is gonna spit out some stuff here. We can, I'll show you how to silence this later, but it's just gonna give us, it's just gonna tell us that we've uh, optimized it. It's run two, two iterations and it took us 0 0.002 seconds. Okay, so let's actually see what it was that happened to our model. And uh, I'm gonna run, oops. I'm going to run these these at show macros just to show you know what what it is that's actually being put out. So if you use this termination status uh, function, that basically checks to see whether or not you know what the status was of your optimization routine. So here it's giving us math math up interface dot optimal. That's good. That means that we we reached an optimal point as judged by CLP. Primal status, for example, is basically the the status of the primal, which is the objective function value. Then there's the dual status which to be honest, I don't understand a whole lot about the duals. Duals are meaningful to some people. I guess they're important to the actual solver, but I don't know when I would like actually care about the dual status relative to the primal status. I feel like I always care about the primal status. Um, the objective value is actually the, you know, the value of our objective function at the maximum point. We have this special value function here where we give it X and it'll actually give us the optimal value of X, which is 14.99999, so 15. And then just below it is the value of y at 1.25. And then we can also get shadow prices and things like that out of this. Right. So this is the value of uh, oh, that's why that's why you want to name the constraints, because then you can just put it right in there. So you can do C1 and get out, you know, negative 0 0.25 for our C for our shadow price if we were able to violate this constraint right here. Infinite testimony. Okay. All right, so that's all that's all really nice. Um, if you are estimating a bunch of these models, sometimes you want to be able to save them to disk. So just like very good scientific practice to make sure that you save your optimization routines somewhere. And so jump exports this really nice function called write to file. You put model, the model you just estimated in the first argument, and then some, some file location. And then you can read it from disk with read from file. So in this case, I'm saving it and then I'm reloading it back into the same spot. 
So this is a really, really good way to save your models so that you can share them with people or so that you can store them and bring them up later in between different Julia sessions. So um, jump has kind of solved this annoying behavior or like maybe acceptable behavior that often has. So if you try to get the value of you know, your, your variables and jump has not solved, it'll throw an error at you, which is maybe what you want. Um, but you should also probably not rely on jump throwing errors at you. That's kind of bad programming practice. You should actually check whether or not your model optimized. So get termination, so call termination status. Um, and it will give you a bunch of termination codes. So if you go check the docs here, it'll give you one of these many, one of these, one of these codes here. So like no resolve, infeasible, um, optimal, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, so, you know, keep an eye out for like whether or not you're actually optimizing anything. All right. And so for example, I've written this, I've written this optimization problem that's not actually solvable. Actually, here, let me make this bigger for a second, sorry. So I'm gonna use CLP here. I'm gonna set two variables, X and Y, they have to be between zero and one. I'm gonna constrain their sum to be greater than or equal to five, which is not possible, right? Because I just told you X and Y have to be between zero and one. There's no way to make those sum up to five. And then I'm just gonna try and maximize their difference, okay? And so if I run this, um, you'll see that termination status gives me the result infeasible. And you'll note infeasible here is not a string. It's not a symbol. It's actually a very, you know, jump exports all caps, a variable called infeasible that maps to this, um, this map op result thing. And so you can check whether or not it's infeasible. You can also do optimal is basically what I would do to say like, hey, did I actually solve this? And we'll see that it is not. All right. So you know you can use that to basically check and do different behavior based on whether you you know whether you solved it or not. But sometimes maybe you just want an error. Um, so one of the really cool things about Jump is that you can change a bunch of solver attributes with this really simple set solver attribute function. So like so let's say you want to change like solution tolerances or like. Um, you know, you want to change like max iterations or you want to change like verbosity level so it reports more stuff to you. You can use set solver attribute model, the name of the attribute as a string and then whatever the value is. So this can help you like debug issues if your solvers aren't, super, aren't converging a whole lot. Um, but uh, it's definitely worth noting that all solvers have different attributes. So you need to look up the one specific to your solver. So let's take a look at the attributes for CLP. So usually this is found in, you know, when you import the package, these are all the things that we can set with jump. So primal tolerance, dual tolerances, um, you can see the defaults there. You can see the maximum iterations, it's quite large. You can set a maximum seconds if you want uh, that to be the case. There's a log level parameter if you want CLP to spit out a bunch of stuff about, uh, about your problem at you while it's running, uh, so on and so forth. Um, so you can just kind of pick any one of these and change them. So in this case, what I've done is I am, I'm using a CLP again, but this time I'm setting the log level attribute to four, which is like the, the high, high verbosity level. And so in this case, I'm gonna go back to our infeasible problem here, right? Which is the impossible one to solve. And you'll see it starts, it starts spitting out a bunch more information. Um, and um, you know all these solvers vary; like they're completely different in what the output is. But you can use them occasionally to debug them if they're you know significantly more more uh, more likely. But you'll note here that that uh, CLP finds the problem is infeasible right at the get go. It's impossible. It's impossible to solve this. Um, so yeah, like definitely you can look at optimizer attributes. If you need to adjust tolerances or anything like that, um, just go look at the the. the jump attributes for your solver. Okay. Now, 
you can specify, you know, so you can specify most inequality constraints. So for example, I'm creating a model here and I'm not giving any objective function, just a bunch of variables for now. And this first one here is unconstrained. This is this defaults to a continuous, continuous real that can go from negative infinity to infinity. The second line here gives me has to be positive or not negative. This one has to be less than or equal to one. So that's giving it an upper bound. You can specify an interval if you want to, and you can specify that it has to be equal to four if you need to. Um, that one is not super useful, um, just because you know. If I know that it's four, I can plug in four. I don't need to need to do that. But you know, that's something you can do, and your solver, solver your solver will just kind of handle it. Um, it's also really common to work with like vector or matrix variables. Um, so this is kind of a case that a lot of people have, where you might have like a bunch of decision variables. Um, and uh, the way that we we would do this is you basically specify the range in brackets right next to the variable in. So right now this first line creates a X vector with uh, five elements in it. So X1, X2, X3, X4, X5. And then this one here is a five by five array Y. And, and we can see that it has uh, 30 parameters, five for X, 25 for Y. Okay. So that's how you create um, vector valued arrays. You can also do this with variables outside. So if I set N equal to 10 and I just change these all to N, It'll also dynamically create the size. So now I have 110 variables. Okay. All right. So you can also add constraints to vector variables in actually a really nice way. Um, so the way that I do this here is I'm basically using this at variable macro again, and I'm basically creating a constraint where um, I have a three dimensional array. And I'm requiring x, basically x1, so that's i equals to 1, to be greater than or equal to the square root of 1, which is 1, and to be less than or equal to 1 squared, which is also 1. For x2, this is, it has to be between the square root of 2 and 2 squared. Right, so what is that, 1.1, 1.2, something like that, um, and 4. And so you can create all kinds of interesting bounds with vector variables just by specifying i is equal to this, this size, one through three, and then using that i in other places. So another, another value for this would be like bounds is equal to rand three. And then you could just change this if you wanted to, to be like do a diff, let's do y for example. Um, I could do y, uh, one through three is less than or, uh, less than or equal to I equals one through three bounds i. And so now I have a bunch of random bounds for y that I've stored in a variable outside. Okay. So that's that's just a kind of a, a, a nice fun thing about gems that you can do. All right. If you want to work with integer or binary variables, you just specify the type in the third argument of the variable function, variables macro. So bin here is true, false, one, zero. So for binary, int is any integer. So this keeps it from being a real number. Um, and you can specify bounds just in the same way, right? So this is um, x int limited here is, has to go be, e, be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. And it can't be any, any real values in that range. Okay, so these are, these, are, these are just like a really nice way to work with integer and binary variables, all right? If you're working with positive semi-definite and or symmetric matrix variables, you can specify that as well right after when you create them, right? So here I'm creating a matrix um, uh, one by N, one by N of sigma, and I can call that, I can enforce that to be PSD. Um, I can also enforce it to be symmetric. I was not able to find a way to make it PSD and symmetric. Um, so I don't know, I'm not, I'm, I'm sure there's a way, but. I don't know what it is, um, but hopefully one, one or the other gets you by. Um, but this is a really, really nice tool. Okay. So you can add a ton of constraints to your model. 
Um, so take like the following example, like I just have, um, here I'll zoom in on the actual code here for a second, but I can basically say like, all right, I have five X's and then I have five Q's and these are between, these are all between zero and one. I'm requiring that their inner product has to be less than or equal to 15. I am requiring that the sum of Q has to be equal to one. Um, I have a nonlinear constraint here, which is, um, you know, these two have to, you know, Q5 times X1 plus two times X3 has to be less, blah, 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 right? This is just kind of a gnarly nonlinear constraint. Same thing for this one down here, that the square root of the sum has to be less than or equal to 100. Um, and you'll note I'm using NL constraint here. If you don't use NL constraint, it'll get mad at you. Uh, sorry, this was the one that should be it. Square root is not defined for generic, generic quad expression. Are you trying to build a nonlinear problem? Make sure you use that NL constraint, which is really, really handy. So you just put NL constraint when they tell you. Okay, and then I specify the objective function, which is just maximize the dot product between the two. Okay, so you can have like all kinds of absolutely gnarly, gnarly constraints if you want to. And you can programmatically add these, right? They get added every time you call acting loop. You can, you know, you can do whatever you want. You can have functions and add constraints. You can do any kind, anything. Um, so it's really, really nice to, to have these. And here's an example of programmatic constraints. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm basically specifying, I have 10 Z variables, and then I'm drawing some random vector, uh, some random normals, 10 of them. Then I'm gonna go through each of those X's. And if that X is less than is negative or you know, non-positive, then I'm going to add a constraint where I'm going to make sure that Z at the same point is also non-positive. And so now I have only four constraints that I've added programmatically. So you can, ima you can imagine having very complex con control flows to add whatever kind of constraints or variables or whatever you need. Um, in some research with Shosh, we ended up doing like something very similar to this where we end up where we end up doing a lot of like programmatic constraint adding for different kinds of cases for things that need to be solved problems that need to be solved okay so this is kind of nice all right so um i'm gonna walk through this uh, this this example here um just kind of with everyone so we're going to do this portfolio optimization problem I love portfolio optimization problems because I'm a finance person and this is apparently all we do. Um, and jump, the jump docs have uh, an example of this. It's a little non-traditional, I think, in portfolio optimization. I've adapted it a little bit. Um, but I'll give you kind of an example of how to do this. Okay. So suppose we have some stocks that follow some, some, some assets that have returns that follow a very known distribution of mu and sigma. And I'm just gonna draw them at random. I don't, I don't necessarily care what they are, um, but you know, they are, they are known to me, okay? And I'm gonna start putting these in, the, uh, in my little, my code thing here. All right, so I'm gonna uh, put it here. All righty. All right. So let's say we have some investor and they want to allocate their wealth to each of these stocks. So it's to minimize their portfolio risk. And they're going to set the return to this, you know, some desired expected return capital R. And, um, oh, this math should be, whoopsie. Okay. So basically what they're going to do is they're going to, um, the decide portfolio weight Q. These are all between negative one and one. So negative one means you're shorting a stock and um, a negative value means you're shorting. A positive value means you're buying a stock. And they're gonna minimize the variance of their portfolio. So the variance of their portfolio is just Q prime sigma Q. We're assuming that the investor knows sigma. And so they basically have to um, assign all of their wealth to all these stocks, to all these assets. So that's why we're having this, this sum constraint here, right? Q, the sum of all the weights needs to be equal to one. 
And then I'm going to specify that the portfolio that I pick has to meet the return R. So if I want 10%, 10% return, there is a minimum variance portfolio, or there usually is a minimum variance portfolio that gives me 10%, but has the smallest possible variance for 10% return. And then I'm going to specify that all the QIs have to be between negative one and one. So um, you can't like massively le leverage your position. Um, uh, okay. So we're going to use jump and IP opt to calculate the optimal portfolio for the, this investor in this economy. Okay, so I'm just gonna kind of walk through this. You know, you, you can start on this on your own, but I'm just gonna kind of launch into it. Um, and if you have, you know, if you're like ahead of me, you can wrap your jump code in a function called opt portfolio that returns a tuple with the variance, the portfolio variance and the expected return for a given R. So use this, use, you can use plots to plot the efficient frontier if you know what that is, which is basically the variance Q prime sigma Q on the x-axis and Q prime mu on the y-axis. All right. Okay. All righty, let me pull up my example here. And we're probably gonna finish early as well, so. Massive plus for people. All right. So I'm going to start by doing my imports here. I'm going to bring in jump. And then I'm going to bring in our solver, which I'm going to use IP opt. Um, I tried with a couple other solvers. Pius has a little bit of trouble with this, um, but IP opt is like, I've, I've had a lot of success with IP opt and I'm like a big fan of it. So like, if you're running into it, this is, this is kind of a nice one. Okay. So remember, the thing we're trying to optimize is our portfolio weights. Okay, so I'm going to use that variable. Oops. We allocate model. So I'm going to create model is equal to model. IP opt dot optimizer. Okay. And then when I'm going to add my variables, I'm going to start with just adding Q. And I'm going to have Q and I have N stocks. So I have one weight for every, every stock that I have, which I've defined as 10 up here. And then I'm going to constrain these to be less than or equal to one and greater than or equal to one or greater than or equal to negative one. Okay. All right, so let's go back and look at our problem because I've forgotten. Um, so we're going to look at our minimization objective here. Oops, here. I'll actually do the math, so I'm not cheating. Um, so we're minimizing Q prime sigma Q. So I'm just gonna specify the objective function with the out objective macro. And I'll get a Q prime mu, or sorry, sigma times Q. Okay, so we've got a we've got a, a nice little set of objective here. And then I'm going to add the positivity constraint or the, um, the sum constraint, which is sum Q has to be equal to one. All right, let's make sure I got the, the other one here. And then I'm going to have to add the um, expected return constraint, which is Q prime mu has to be equal to some value R. And right here, R is actually not existing. R does not exist yet. So I'm going to set it up right here. I'm going to say like, I don't know, 0 0.15. So 15% expected return. So what this says is please find me the minimum variance portfolio. That's this part here, minimum variance. Oh, this should also say min to specify what it is that we're doing with our objective. Um, please find me the minimum variance portfolio um, by varying Q between negative one and one, such that all the Qs sum up to one and Q prime mu gives me 0 0.15. And then let's see if I did it. Uh, normally I don't. Uh, I can't think of the, the last time something I wrote worked, worked the first time. Oh, what did I call this function? Port. That's right. Oh, man. I got little active pinkies there. Okay. So while this is pre compiling, pre compiling jump, we just kind of look at this and uh, think about how we're going to consider doing this like optimal portfolio function. Okay. So optimal portfolio 
is a thing that accepts a given R and it returns the optimal value um, Q hat. These are like the, the Qs that we've actually optimized. Okay. And I'm gonna kind of start writing this here. Uh, I'm actually just going to adapt this function, this code that I've written so that it works um, for any given R. So I'm gonna wrap this in a function by just kind of starting up here. What did I want to call it? Op portfolio. And it accepts an R. I'm just going to put everything inside of this function block. Okay. All right. So as of right now, what this function does is it just optimizes the model, but it doesn't return the things that I want. Let me make sure that it worked. Nope, oh, still going. All right. So what I want this function op portfolio to return is the optimal Q times the sigma times Q, the optimal Q. Um, and it just needs to be a tuple of the variance on the left of the tuple and the expected return on the right of the tuple. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna expect Q, Q star, extract Q star. These are the optimum values that I just calculated, um, that I hopefully calculated from the optimum optimizer. And I'm just gonna do value dot Q. So the reason I'm doing value dot is that Q is a vector. Use it, Q is a vector here. So I want to go through each element of it and extract the value into an array. All right, extract optimal values. All right. And then I'm just going to return the values that I wanted to return. So this will be Q, uh, Q star sigma times Q star. All right, that's gonna be the thing on the left. And then I'm gonna do Q star prime mu. Okay. And actually returning Q star prime mu is like a little pedantic, a little useless because Q prime mu has to be equal to R, right? Which is the input of this function. Um, sometimes they can diverge, but uh, not by much usually. All right. All right, failed to precompile IP opt. Uh oh. All right, well, it wants me to instantiate. Oh my God, what a pain. Okay, well, I've actually written the, I've written the function down below, so we'll just use this um, because I planned ahead. What a, what a smart guy, Cameron. Okay. So this here is kind of the optimal function that I would like to have written that would have worked um, if I didn't have to deal with like little package errors and things to, to handle, um, which actually looks like what I wrote. So I'm actually very pleased. Um, so what I've written here is this optimal portfolio thing that just traces out the optimal portfolio, right? This is this problem is actually kind of like meaningless because you can solve this with linear algebra because um, it's a very simple like quadratic quadratic problem. Um, but all I'm going to do is I'm going to pick some, pick some expected returns that I want to have between negative one and one. I'll just pick some values. I don't know, like a hundred, something like that. Um, and then I can map them out. And I've also added this, there's this, this function in jump called set silent. Set silent is really handy because it shuts your, your, your thing up, right? So a lot of the optimizer packages tend to spit out a lot of like text to debug what's going on and give you progress reports. Um, but if you just set silent, you can just kind of ignore that. So this function will just go through and calculate all the, all the values of the returns. And so on the left-hand side here, I see the variance for a given portfolio. On the right-hand side, I see a given return. Okay, so I'll silence that for a second. And then let me plot out the efficient frontier. And if you are a person who's ever taken like an intro to finance class, you probably recognize this shape, right? This is like a, a very classic, classic shape of the efficient frontier. And like it actually has to have this shape. Okay. And uh, that's kind of like actually where I think we should stop because I, you know, uh, I think this is kind of like a good, good time. So um, yeah. So that's jump. Like jump is like really handy and super nice to use. And this is how you put it in a function. Um, 
Yeah. Okay. I just kind of stop. Thank you. Have a good day. <laughs>